Hi, good evening and welcome to the January 25th, 2021 CCSD 59 Board of Education Committee of the Whole meeting. And I'll turn the meeting over to Board President Janice Krinsky to begin the agenda. Thank you very much, Ben, and welcome everybody to our board meeting tonight. I would like to call the meeting to order. Um, Ms. Petrielli? Unmute. All right, Krinsky. Present. Garlovich? Present. Lane? Present. Mencia? Present. Petrelli here. Reed? Present. And Schumacher? Mardell, I see you. I don't hear you. Muted. I'm present. Okay. We're Thank all you here. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to go to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. Uh, I am going to request of the board that we reverse uh, the order on the agenda because we have 10 um, comments and suggestions from the public. So I would like to do those after the action items if I have uh, a, a, the support of the board to do that. Is that all right with you? Fine. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so let's move on immediately to the action items before us. Would someone please like to make a motion uh, for item 5.01? I'll make the motion. Um, be it resolved that on the 25th day of January 2021, the Community Consolidated School District 59 Board of Education hereby appoints, uh, and I say the name, correct, Janice? Yes. Yes. Uh, hereby appoints Dr. Terry Bresnahan as superintendent effective J July 1st, 2021. Be it further resolved that on the 25th day of January 2021, the Community Consolidated School District 59 Board of Education hereby approves the contract for the position of superintendent at a base salary of $235,000 effective Jan uh, July 1st, 2021. Do we have a second? I'll second. Courtney, I'll second. Oh, Courtney? Okay, roll call, please. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. roll call, please. Okay. Um, Garlovich? Aye. Lane? Aye. Mencia? Aye. Petrelli? Aye. Reed? Aye. Schumacher? Aye. And Krinsky? Aye. And the motion passes. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to read a quick statement. Uh, introducing Dr. Bresnahan since she couldn't be here tonight. The board welcomes Dr. Terry Bresnahan as the 10th superintendent, not including interims, in the 75 year history of Community Consolidated School District 59 and the first woman to lead the district. Dr. Bresnahan will officially begin work on July 1st, 2021. Out of all the well qualified candidates School Exec Connect brought to us, Dr. Bresnahan rose to the top because of the depth and breadth of experience she brings to the district. Dr. Bresnahan comes to us from Berkeley School District 87, where she has served as superintendent for the past six years. Prior to her role as superintendent, she served as the Berkeley School District 87 Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. Because District 87 also has a board meeting tonight, she is unable to join us in person. Dr. Bresnahan is a strong advocate for all children and she has been an outstanding leader in diversity, equity and inclusion work. We believe her current work in a district with very similar demographics as ours will prepare her for success in leading our district. Among her many accomplishments, Dr. Bresnahan was able to significantly close the achievement gap in her current district by conducting annual audits of curriculum as well as creating adoption cycles for curriculum and resources. Dr. Bresnahan plans to continue that practice in District 59 to make sure the curriculum is meeting the needs of students and teachers. Her previous experience as an assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction will prove extremely valuable as our district continues to work to strengthen our teaching and learning to best prepare students to be successful for life. And I have a message to everyone from Dr. Bresnahan. 
She states, many thanks to the Board of Education, family, staff, and administration for the honor of serving as the next superintendent. I wish I could be with you tonight, but I am very excited to begin our work together. I am grateful for the trust you have placed in me and am committed to serving all students in CCSD 59. I look forward to being a part of the CCSD 59 family. And with that, I welcome Dr. Bresnahan. Okay, uh, does anyone else on the board want to say anything? Or shall we, we'll, we'll, we'll invite her to come uh, another time when she's available. So uh, why don't we move on then to the next action item? Will someone please make a motion for 5.02? Mardell will do it. Be it resolved that on the 25th day of January 2020, 2021, the Community Consolidated School District 59 Board of Education approves the donation from Shin Yoen Foundation to District 59 Education Foundation in the amount of $40,000. This donation will be used to help empower families by helping them with financial needs. Be it further resolved that the superintendent shall communicate to the Shin Yuen Foundation in writing, expressing the appreciation of the members of the Board of Education, and that this donation shall be listed in the official minutes of this meeting. This is one of the largest donations that I can remember we have received, so I am extremely grateful to the Shin Yuen Foundation for this. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second it. Oh, who was Thank that? Thank you. Uh, Randy, do you want to say a few words as the let me say it, you want me to say it now or you want me to say it now or before or after until after we um, vote on it? Uh well, fine. You can wait. Okay. Uh roll call, please. Lang? Aye. Vencia? Aye. Petrelli. Aye. Reed? Aye. Schumacher? Aye. Krinsky? Aye. Karlovich. Aye. And the motion passes. So everyone, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little background on the um, Shinyu Foundation. Um, it's kind of, first of all, let me get, let me get back to my notes. Um, it is one of five Buddhist temples located throughout the U.S. Um, the one in Elk Grove was opened in, or was dedicated in 2001. Um, Kind of to tell you some more about it, their the foundation their foundation is based in um, California, but they have been very involved in the communities that they're that they're part of. Um, they have been working closely with um, character counts with the Edward um, the Kenneth Young Foundation, and have done some work with the District Fifty Nine Foundation. So um, through that partnership that we previously established them um, in November of last year, they reached out the foundation reached out to organizations within the boundaries of all their temples um, with a goal of, um, or with my note, with a goal to basically um, donate $40,000 that they wanted to disperse to organizations who met criteria of supporting families in great need. Um, after selecting the recipients, the monies will be to be equally distributed between the organization. Um, so basically Karen Armansky, ex-board member, was contacted and she reached out to them and share with some of the great stuff that we had done um, with the community over the, since, since the beginning of COVID and stuff like that. Um, she worked very closely with them. And through that hard work, we were awarded the entire $40,000 grant on a one-time basis for the whole country, basically, of that's covered by the Buddhist, by this um, Shenyu Foundation. So it was um, really a really big, a really big one for the Education Foundation. I know I've been telling you, you all you for a long time that these there's a small group of ladies that are doing a tremendous amount of work, and this is one great example of what they have been doing. So, thank you to the foundation, to the Education Foundation, and to Shin Yu for this great donate um, grant. I mean, it really is amazing. When I first heard about it, I was like, almost kind of brought me to tears of you know how much you know a community that we really have not spent much time with, but I hope we maybe can learn to spend more time with and appreciate has given our district such a great gift. Are they the ones that are located on near Arlington Heights Road and, and uh, Tony? Uh, well, more closer to the um, Arlington Heights Road and Devon. Oh, okay, thank you. It's near my house. Mm -hmm. It's really remarkable that they chose us. And it, we really should thank uh, Dr. Katie Osell as well because it's the work 
that they did with foundation money um, in the opportunity fund to create an empowerment fund to support our families, especially in this time of COVID. So it really was a group effort between uh, the, the foundation, of course, and the district. And uh, I'm really, really grateful for their support. It is a one-time only grant, um, but it's a good amount of money that can go far in supporting our families who struggle. So uh, I am really grateful to them. Any, any other comments? Okay, seeing none, I am going to go to comments and suggestions from the public. Okay. Dear board, I have never seen kids this excited to be in school. I'm ready to let you know what you have probably heard, how excited and successful it has been to allow students who want to return in person. Finally, a chance to do so. These kids need the emotional support from our teachers from being in a school environment and we need to continue to push forward. We all agree that cutting the day short and having travel happen over lunch is not ideal. Please move immediately to allow for lunch to be served and give this option to more families to be able to send their kids to school. I would also like to see us moving forward with moving kids back to school full time for more than two days. I'm aware how small a lot of the classrooms are with half of the population returning in person. I sure hope that those classrooms that can invite students for more than two days because their groups are small do so without delay. We have so many mitigation factors which are all working so not being so conservative is needed. Having kids be in a routine is important right now. Two days a week, then three days at home is inefficient and throws the kids off as they try to remember what day it is. Is it their turn to go to class, et cetera? Move the needle and get our kids back to school every day. It is critical to their success. The kids have shown how committed they are to following directions, potentially reducing the six foot guidance is something we may have to do but it's happening elsewhere, so we should consider it too. And sign Scotty Smith, who's a Devonshire parent. The next one is from Millie Patel. And it says, thank you for finally allowing an option for kids in schools. I was happy to hear this happened. Unfortunately, it did not give me choice as I have to work outside the home and my child could not go back with no full school day option. It's important to think about the parents who have to work and may not have financial state to hire a nanny to pick up kids from school at 1230. From my neighbors and other parents, I've heard great things from school starting and kids are great at following directions and guidance and no concerns about protocol. If that's the case and they are able to eat snacks safely, it's now time to extend the day to full days to allow the kids to have a good routine without interruption of the day. Kids are getting so much from being at school. Please make this option viable for all parents who want their kids in school now. I hope this step, with this step, we can continue the momentum and extend to the full days in school then to more than two. Um, okay, and that was from Millie Patel. And the next one is from Gosia Ignut. Hello, first of all, I would like to express how grateful I am that the district has finally decided to take baby steps and open up our schools. You have no idea the excitement of my kids last Tuesday morning when I told them that they are going in person. Last time I told them this, they got the bad news that we aren't. This was in October. I dropped off both kids, K and third grade. It was kind of sad because it was a snowy day and we could not get nice first day of school photos but that's okay. I barely said goodbye to them as they rushed inside the school. They were so beyond excited to see their teacher and their fellow students. When it was time for pickup, they were sad that this day was over. However, for the next two hours, it was nonstop talking about how happy and overjoyed they were to be back. Imagine a kindergartner's face when she finally got to see her teacher in person, teaching. She said that she finally understood parts of a book something that I have been trying to explain to her since August. She goes back for one day, a few hours, and she finally understands it. Why? Because she learned it from her teacher. Because her teacher explains it better than mommy. Because her teacher is her teacher. A third grader 
over the moon, is excited to see his friends that he hasn't seen since March. He was so excited to be in a classroom at a regular classroom setting, telling me his teacher is so nice and caring and he wishes the day was longer. Learning multiplication in a classroom. He also told me that he learned more in a few hours. Thank you, District 59, for taking these baby steps and allowing our kids in the classrooms. Please allow for more days so these kids can actually feel like school is school. The teachers have been beyond amazing. I would give them the moon and the stars if I could just, if I could, just to thank them for all their hard work that they have put in. Please consider opening up days. Thank you. Signed, Margaret Ignu. All right. The next one is anonymous. Okay. Dear board members, thank you for your first steps in allowing our students to participate in hybrid instruction. What a great experience it has been during the last two weeks. Our school building is alive again and the students are excited to be here. I have had students tell me how much fun they are having when in person and how they continue to be included while at home. I have been able to build more personal connections with my class and have provided them with hands-on experiences that would have been much more difficult to recreate in a remote setting. Kids are excited to learn and be with their peers, even when needing to watch their distance. The lessons from our SEL coach, Mrs. Frank, have been especially helpful in setting up successful learning spaces for the students after being gone for almost a year. I have heard from the parents that their children are either asking to attend more than two days or that they have noticed an enormous positive change in them as a result of coming to school in person. I wish this opportunity could be extended to beyond a four hour day or a two day week. While some students have had the opportunity to come to school for four days, this would, could be easily extended to other students who need it. We don't need engagement data to prove that kids belong in school. For instance, if a student had logged into Zoom a handful of times since August, and now he or she are at school in person, thriving, communicating, creating, and growing, why not allow them to do so for a longer period of time? It's clear that's what we need. Our school administration and staff are all doing a great job following the safety protocols so the students can learn in a safe environment. This makes me confident that if our days were longer or if we invited more students to attend for four versus two days, we'd be opening so many opportunities to them. If a classroom has two to three students in group A and B each, why can't those groups be combined to offer four days of in-person instruction? On the other hand, the students who are remote might continue to struggle with being an active participant for many reasons, and we can't reach across the screen to help them. Many staff members feel helpless in these situations. A student has shared with me that he likes school because he can learn differently. When I asked what he meant, he shared that he doesn't have to use his device and can physically feel the school. That's why, why, uh, why can't we then offer this to the kids who need it the most? All of our kids, especially if the in-person groups are small in size. I hear parents say their children experience difficulties with the amount of screen time while at home. Let's decrease that and bring them to school to learn in person. I trust that your next steps will be aggressive and thoughtful ones so our students receive the expenses they deserve. Again, that was anonymous. Uh, the next one is from Casper Shajurik, Shajurik, sorry. Um, it's getting easier to say, but I'm still struggling a little. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed, I lost it. Just a minute. All right. Dear board members, I'd like to thank you for making a great decision in reopening our schools. Our two children are very excited to be attending school in person. Our son who normally is indifferent about going to school and can handle the online expectations just fine has shared with us how much he enjoys going. He even makes choices at school to work on tasks that he normally would not pick at home or would feel forced to complete. He enjoys them at school while working under the guidance of his teacher and another staff member. He also takes his time while at home. He might rush and not work up to his potential since he does not have a grown up with him to guide him consistently enough to reinforce certain skills. His class at school is very small and we would only hope he can go to school the whole week, not just two days. If there were so few kids who attend in person, why can't the Monday and Tuesday group be combined with the Thursday and Friday group? Wouldn't the children get so much more out of that? 
we continue to be concerned that a four hour day followed by about two hours of independent work at home is not the best solution. There isn't always two hours worth of engaging work offered for that asynchronous time, leaving us to come up with extra academic tasks while trying to work ourselves. In addition, our daughter has had a great experience returning to school. She has even been able to attend small groups outside of her homeroom and interact with peers that perform on her level. She has been challenged and offered opportunities to work with peers like her. While some of her in-person instruction remains on Zoom, it still has given her the opportunity to leave home and be at school where all of the kids belong. I feel confident that the board will act accordingly and open up more opportunities for our students, extend the days, extend the hours, open the schools and allow kids to learn. Okay. And now the next one is from Micah Koval. Maybe. I'm sorry, that's Mika Koval. And her, uh, let's see, her comment is as follows. I'm sure it's safe to say that we've had successful, uh, a successful start back to in-person instructions. I appreciate all the hard work that had been done by teachers, administrators, staff, and parents to get my kids back in the classroom where they belong. But there is still a lot of work to be done to get kids back where they are the safest and to overcome the damage that they have endured up to this point. The only way to do so is to reopen schools for a full week of in-person instructions. It's not just a year, it is a big fraction of my kids' lives. The mitigation strategies have been successfully implemented at CCSD 59 schools Understanding that our children's education is of vital importance with the support of administration, teachers, students, and parents, we need to do everything that we can to have these schools open for in-person learning full time. We, the adults, are in this together for them, for our kids. The mitigation strategies are now familiar to all. The past two weeks gave my children a ray of hope, a glimmer of normalcy and long needed stability. We have already let our children down. All that emphasis is actually in the message by asking them to protect us, the adults, the teachers, the community. We need to stop asking them to take one for the team. They have to return to a place of social connection full time. We want them to be ready and afraid and encouraged. It is our job to make that happen for them. Let's move forward, extended person instruction to full days and put all our energy and effort towards bringing them back into the classroom for a full week. Signed, Monica Koval, mom of six-year-old Leon and eight-year-old Milena. Okay. The next one is from Rosa Kursjak. Kursjak. I'd like to write to show my encouragement and support for getting students back to normal this month, uh, back to school this month. I could already see the kids with a fresh and positive attitude and those that chose to return back. A sense of relief to finally be back in school. From an adult perspective, I continue to worry about the kids' mental health, lack of social interaction and leaving behind kids that could not return due to the lack of a full day at school. I understand the various factors for teachers and their increased difficulty with managing groups and, and parents who are hesitant about returning kids. But I keep coming back to the kids and what is best for them, which is getting them back to school for full days in more than just two days. There will always be reason that we should hold off or wait for data, but that hasn't proven efficient before and we missed great opportunities for kids to be back earlier. As the board, you made the decision to return back last month, even when things were strained in terms of state and community metrics. We need to remember those metrics will vary, but as long as the schools are following agent, uh, health and safety processes, and we now focus on school metrics, we need to move forward. Our goal should be to bring the kids back now. So I hope to see that decision made today. Okay. The next one is from Violeta Gorchola. To the BOE, my child, Chloe Wartzala, is a first grade student enrolled in CCSD 59. 
As parents, I don't consider reopening schools for two days, four hours per week as a success. I want to believe it is just a start to a full reopening soon. My child is a first grade student that as of today cannot write or read. As many of the kids at her age, online learning didn't benefit her in many in any ways. Even the best teacher can't teach how to read and write via Zoom meeting. That's why our BOE, school district and teachers union should do anything to bring our kids back to school five days per week and full day. Surrounding school districts, private and Catholic schools, daycare centers are open. And I do believe our district can do better than that with all the resources and, and budget. With COVID cases going down and vaccinations and safety protocols, our kids, our kids can be attending school in a safe environment. Absolutely. Parents that wish to have their kids learning remotely should have that option. And the best interests of our kids, their intellectual and mental growth is to get back to schools as soon as possible. Thank you, Violetta Grotola. All right, there's two more. This next one is from Karen Davidson. Uh, it's an attachment, which I need to open. Hold on a minute. Dear Board of Education members, I'll keep this short. Hybrid seems to be working and that is great, but I urge you to be cautious in jumping to opening for longer days. We have had kids in person for five days, including today, and I'm aware of five cases reported already. The tracker is outdated since it runs Wednesday to Wednesday and only goes through January 20th. Well, of course, these five cases weren't spread at school. These are now our patient zeros, so to speak. We must wait two weeks from the notification of these five cases to see what happens. However, even that data will be skewed. It is ridiculous that parents are not notified when a case occurs in their child's class. We get notes home when there is a case of strep throat or lice. COVID should be no exception. No, they might not be considered a close contact and need to quarantine by CDC guidance. But as a parent, I still want to know if a case was in that close proximity. We are so close to having teachers able to be vaccinated. Many are likely getting their first dose this weekend and over the next two weeks. Please do not consider extending the day to include lunch with no masks until this can ramp up and they can get their second dose. Also, the news is reporting that the new variant strains are not only more contagious, but may also be more deadly. And kids are more likely to get infected by the UK variant than they were by the original strain. I've provided a link to an article about how the new variant has hit Israel. 40% of the cases from the new variant were in children and they saw a huge rise, especially in children aged six to nine. It seems prudent to maintain the hybrid half day model for at least another month or so until we have more access to vaccination and more data on the new variant. I have one more to read. I just want you to know that all these emails are forwarded to the board so they all have the link in them uh, so that, that we can all read that same article that was posted. Okay, this one's from Nicole Hain. Dear CCSD 59 School Board, I would like to take this opportunity to applaud our teachers and staff on a successful trans transition to hybrid learning. Students, parents, and staff have all gone through an adjustment period over the last couple of weeks. The students and teachers are beginning to settle into the critical academic rhythm of all good classrooms. That is why I recommend against changing the schedule again so soon and that the current schedule remains in place for now. We are still going through this process and it's important that we make sure our mitigation strategies are airtight. With the first cases of COVID-19 appearing in our school only days after opening, I think caution is warranted. Waiting at least another two weeks will allow our administrators to see if transmission within the school is happening. And if it is, where the vulnerabilities in our practices are. We need to know the school is safe before expanding into uncertain territory and uncertainties abound. Consider the 15 minute masks off snack break. Are the students and staff vulnerable during that time? What are the procedures if a COVID case is detected in an exposed population? This situation is uncertain by nature and we will be wise to take a cautious approach. Thanks again to the school board administration and staff keeping our community safe. 
Okay, that concludes the um, public comment section of the meeting. Uh, thank you to everyone who reached out to us. We take all the messages that we hear seriously. Uh, we're gonna move on now to 5.0 action items. We already did that. Oh yeah, sorry. I think I'm a little tired. I thought it sounded familiar. Okay, we're up to 6.0 discussion items. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we'd like to begin the discussion items with uh, some follow-up from the last board meeting uh, connected to the demographic study. Uh, on January 15th, um, Ron O'Connor, myself, and Mardell Schumacher had the opportunity to interview two of the demographers. Uh, at that point in time, or just prior to that, uh, Janice, the board suggested that we develop some pros and cons. So Ron's going to walk through uh, the process. Um, he has already shared the slides, the notes, and other things with the board. Talk about pros and cons, and then um, we'll be, bring a recommendation that we'd like to move for action at our next board business meeting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Assistant Superintendent for uh, Finance, Ron O'Connor. Ron? Thank you, Dr. Fessler. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, if we can go to the next slide for the demographer uh, recommendation. So just like Dr. Fessler said, uh, the board had given us direction to explore the school classroom enrollment data because we didn't want to just build uh, based on what we've seen. We wanted to actually do some research on it, see what space issues that may exist or potential. So the committee did potential data. We looked at two elementary schools. All right. <laughs> So we examined uh, current and projected data. Uh, we were looking at recommendations and we wanted to address these maximizing our classroom and workspaces in 59. The two elementary schools that really brought this to our attention, and uh, I also thank uh, Tom Ludloff for that because he did talk about uh, Brentwood and Claremont to us, uh, transforming the teacher's lounge, uh, it, uh, Brentwood to an art and music classroom. And then Claremont has a growing dual language program, so they need additional space. But we talked to Nicholas and Associates, they said the approximate cost was about $500,000 per classroom, which would amount to 1.5 to $2 million. So what we did was we talked to three demographers, we went it down to two, and on January 14th, we interviewed virtually Casarda and Cropper. So this is what we came up with. Uh, Casarda is firm one. So you look at the pluses and the deltas. Uh, Casarda has a lot of experience in our area. Uh, they can do a demographic study at a reasonable cost of about $10,000 and um, they can complete it in six to eight weeks. However, they have not worked with 59. Uh, John Casarda would not make boundary and program movement suggest, uh, suggestions like we wanted. And um, there was a virtual report of a study at an additional cost if we were to talk about slides and whatnot, it would have added a decent amount of more dollars. He also indicated that COVID-19 may skew any projection data on demographic studies. Whereas Cropper said, uh, he has a broad experience as well. They've worked in 59. Uh, they can bring this demographic revisions and they can bring the boundary study for $14,800. So they can make suggestions. I mean, they're, they're professionals. We want the experts to come in and talk about that. They can also do five focus group style forums for the board that we can have community members, board members, uh, any sort of people that we wanted to to have discussion into this. But then there is a Delta as well. They all also indicated that COVID-19 may skew the projection data. So this is what the Finance Facilities Committee came up with. Cropper to us was any related demography work would be the one. They would develop an updated study. Then they would suggest programs and boundary consideration, which Casarda would not do. Cropper would also facilitate five focus group style forums. And then the committees agreed that the program or boundary recommendations are a significant part to make important solution recommendations so we can address maximizing classroom and workspaces instead of just spending 1.5 to $2 million. We need to do our due diligence. So Cropper, their considerations is they're going to look at the current building utilization. 
They want to look at the impact of programs, the locations, student mobility, so where they live versus where they attend schools, like we know about our dual language programs, and the effect on enrollment. Considerations to maximize the school space utilization, so seeing if programs should continue where they are, maybe we should redistrict any sort of grade consider, uh, configuration changes or combination, and they can also do it for six to eight weeks with a report and five conference meetings with our stakeholders for an estimated cost of $14,800. Thank you, Ron. Um, I know that uh, Mardell, uh, again, participated in those uh, interviews. Um, Randy and Robert have, have also been involved in this. Mardell, would you like to, to make any additional comments? I say that I, I appreciated listening to both of them. They were both very, very good speakers and had good things to say. But after listening to both of them and listening to what Dr. Fessler had to say, I agree with Dr. Fessler. We have had Crapper before in the district. They have already saved information from our district and we were satisfied when we had them before. They had the most ideas to share with us of things that they could do for us. And I agree with Dr. Fessler and, and Mr. O'Connor that we probably should spend the money and go with them. It's not a large amount of money and it'll cer certainly in the long run save us a considerable amount if we don't have to add four classrooms. Uh, this is Janice Krinsky. I just want to mention uh, for everybody who's listening out there that um, should we be considering things like boundary changes or, you know, any kind of redistricting, that will not at all be done lightly. I know it's a hot button for a lot of people. Uh, we just need to understand what options we have so that we can move forward fully informed as to what, what is available to us. Um, so I did like the work that Cropper did in the past. I thought it was very sound and very enlightening and helpful. Uh, and so I think it's a fine recommendation, especially after telling us the pros and cons. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, you know, oh, go ahead, Randy. No, you're first. Go ahead. You know, just on that note, Janice, just so I understand and for the for the families at home watching understand too, when we're talking about boundary considerations, that means, you know, possibly moving the boundaries around so kids would go to different schools, right? That's what we're talking about. Correct. Yeah. Right. So, and that's why I don't want people to be upset. It's not like we've made a decision to do anything like right. that. And if we do, it's going to be because we have a really strong reason to do it. But let's get the data take a look and see what that does for us. Go ahead, Randy. So um, one thing that, you know, both the demographers brought up and mentioned was um, COVID could have an impact on these numbers. So what do they suggest going forward? I know knowing that, hey, we have these numbers. Are we gonna have, maybe have them look at the stuff after COVID's over or is that, you know, I think, cause I personally think COVID is gonna be, you know, with us for a long time and it will have an impact on our numbers for years to come. Yeah, they, did, they didn't really respond to what their strategy would be, Randy, but when we worked with uh, Cropper um, about eight years ago, they did a couple of uh, follow-up recommendations, and their demographic studies are typically good for five years at the middle school, 10 years at the elementary. So we're still within that timeline of, of having good data to utilize. So they're going to look at our, our current um, data and, and make some projections that way versus doing a complete comprehensive study, which they thought could, both firms thought could be skewed. So that's the approach that they'll take. I think if it's the pleasure of the board in the aftermath and they want to, you want to update findings um, next year, the following year or, or whatever timeline you want to utilize, that's absolutely a choice. And I think as we begin our work with them, they'll be able to more clearly uh, um, advise the board on what they should do or should consider. Okay. And yeah, then, I have a, oh, sorry, Brian, did you want to finish? I was, going to, I was going to kind of follow up. So they talked about five kind of working sessions. What, what do we envision those working sessions being? So at our, the last time we worked with Cropper, they were, they were awesome. I mean, the, the way they illustrated our attendance boundaries and showed shifts and changes. Uh, and, and really, it was more of a discussion and a work session. So they didn't come in saying, this is what you should do. They would come in and present the current data. And then we would talk through what potential shifts could look like. Now, they had ideas and suggestions um, that were completely non-biased and, um, you know, I don't want to say use the word ignored, but that's the only word I can think of, ignored history. But again, it, it, it was an unbiased recommendation. They would suggest things that we hadn't typically thought of because of uh, historics in our, in our district. So um, 
their their process is I thought it was really really good and uh, very transparent, open, a lot of discussion, uh, uh, somewhat like a committee meeting. But they did indicate that the board could format that any any way they would like. So whether it's a focus group or or, or a committee of the whole meeting with the full board having a discussion in front of an audience, um, they the board would dictate that uh, approach. Great, thank you. If I remember correctly, Dr. Fessler, didn't they also say that they don't really worry much about kindergarten? They go from first grade up. And yeah. I also mentioned that I had been on the boundary committee for many years in the past. And any boundary change that you come up with is bound to make many, many people in the district unhappy. So I don't think that we want to look at this as they are going to definitely use a boundary change suggestion that we will use because that I don't think is the purpose, but they're just talking about where the most children are and where the schools are where we could put more children and so forth. And that's kind of like the boundaries that we would, were talking about, I think. Yeah, they, that's correct. They, they shared that nationally, a lot of kids, some school, many school districts don't have full day kindergarten. Um, so oftentimes parents have some type of a full day placement outside of public schools. Uh, District 59 experienced that years ago when we had half day uh, kindergarten option. But um, yeah, they did say that by and large, the kindergarten numbers um, really uh, don't represent the true numbers at first grade in most cases. Okay, so, Courtney's been waiting. Thank you, Courtney. Thanks, no, I appreciate it, Janice. So I guess my follow up question is how we are going to integrate conversations about equity into the demographic study. And it sounds like Dr. Fessler, given how you described those five working sessions, um, to the extent we have you know, guidance or ideas in that area or concerns, we can bring them out in those working group sessions. But I guess I'm wondering um, to what extent you feel Cropper will be like independently sensitive to those or is the push on equity going to need to be something like we drive as the client? Yeah, I, I think we'll have to drive that information. If you, if you check the notes, and I don't recall the, and the response uh, off the top of my head, but that was one of our questions that we asked both demographer groups. And I don't think either one of them had a strong response to it. Ron, do you remember the response? Or Mardell, do you remember the response? I do. Go ahead, Mardell, were you going to say? No, go ahead, Ron. I, I do remember them saying that when we plot out <clears throat> students, we can kind of see where they are in relation to other students in terms of uh, within their the, the boundaries and how they are in the district. So we can even see how much we're spending yeah. for buildings, that sort of thing. It, it's my sense though, that we'll have to drive that. Correct. Uh, let and let I, me ask a, Also, oh, they said it wasn't, only a case of where the students lived, but where they went to school, because they are not all going to school where they live, because we do so much busing. So that is another equity issue also. Yeah. They did mention that, both of them. Let, let, me, let me ask, a, let me be devil's advocate here. And I, and I mean this in a nice way, and it might sound bad when I say it. But if we, if we used them a couple years ago, five years ago so, or so, why are we having spacing issues now? Like, was the, was the, were, the, were the projections not? what we thought or no, just curious. No, I, I think uh, the, the conversation, Robert, grew, grew out of the, um, the uh, finance and facility committee meetings when we were thinking about or discussing spending $1.5 million mm -hmm. on adding three classrooms. We thought it would be more prudent to spend the $15,000 to look right. at all of our options and really try to make data-driven decisions. Um, so that, that was that was the primary the primary factor. Plus, you know, a few years ago there there was some conversations by the board to to review and revisit our attendance boundaries um, because we haven't done that in such a long time. So we thought that would be a latent effect. But the primary was to make a data driven decision before we would spend any any money on uh, new construction dollars. Sure. And I do Robert, I, I Robert, I think that there is some shifting of the. Um, numbers, you know, the further away you get from the time you initially ran it, the more you're likely to see drift. So I think what they gave us was really, really good, but at times it didn't necessarily track what was actually happening in the district. It still doesn't make it unusable. It's still very valuable information to the extent that it gives you a snapshot of where you are and some of the factors that very well can play into having 
big increases in students coming through the schools. Sure. And you'll see it when you see the data. Mm -hmm. and, that and makes I, sense. I would, I would also suggest that even in the last eight years, our demographic data has, has shifted. Our, um, our free and reduced lunch has increased by seven or eight percent. So I think just examine re-examining that information could be useful conversation as well for the board. Mm -hmm. Also, Robert, I believe that was way back in 2013. Sure, that makes sense. That is correct. All right, so we'd like to bring the recommendation for the, for the board to approve Cropper as not only doing a demographic study, that would be secondary. Primary to that really would be the conversations about um, program placement, um, space utilization, and then even looking at our attendance boundaries and where kids are going to school, where we're busing them from, and as Mardell said, that might be an, an equity piece that we're overlooking that we might be able to address as well as that data emerges. I have two more uh, comments on this. One is, could we um, have Katie Assel put her eyes on this as well so that any things that she can see that are related to equity uh, that we might not have caught could be uh, part of the conversations. I know you're, you have so much free time, Katie. Well, the, the full superintendent's team will be part of this. Oh, good. Okay. Process. Um, and the other thing that I want to state, and this is mostly for the audience in the past, when the board has considered, um, making large changes like this. And the most recent one was at frost when we were talking about whether or not we were going to add classrooms or bring in trailers for a huge uh, increase in population at that school. Um, and we had focus group, we had not focus groups, but forums so that we were able to make sure that the community had a chance to talk to us. We could do it as Dr. Fessler said, as a committee of the whole meeting or a working meeting, but we can also set up separate forums so that we, the board can hear from the community. So we'll make sure there's ample opportunity for the community to speak out if we are going to consider uh, any kind of boundary changes. Okay, I guess we're on to the next um, discussion item. All right, thank you. Um, our, ne our next discussion item will be um, the return to school updates and uh, next steps. Let me open that up real quick. So um, just to preview the forthcoming slides and content, um, we'll begin with the, the January return update. I know that we've only been uh, back in session for about 10 or 11 days, uh, but we wanna talk about some of the highlights. Um, I have asked uh, two of our principals, uh, Mr. Uh, John Harrington and Ms. Mrs. Monica Farfan to, Farfan to um, speak on, on behalf of their experience. And I've also invited our DEA president um, Ms. Uh, Ann Wing to also discuss her perspective of the return to school. After, after those reports, um, um, and there will also be some highlights, uh, Ross and Ben will share some, some pictures of, of what we've done that will demonstrate our mitigation strategies um, and, and some of the work that we're doing in classrooms so the board has a flavor of what's happening in the classrooms during this return. Then we'll move into um, sharing of the hybrid enrollment numbers. We'll look at the internal metrics and, and we'll just review the decision process. I know we've said it, we've shared it several times with the board, but I do from time to time get uh, emails from parents just asking what our current metrics are. So we'll continue to reshare that just so it's a, a repetitive message. Following that, we'll, we'll go into our, our updates again. So we'll talk about instruction, health and safety and, and operations. I have asked that uh, SLT members during those uh, comments also share not only the highlights, but the challenges that we're experiencing. So the board has a full picture of what's working well and then other things that we're still working on planning and that are, are challenging us in this process. Um, and then the last couple of slides will be the next steps overview. So we'll just highlight some of the planning that's in place. And then I wanna end with revisiting our steps and consideration chart. Uh, we'd share this with the board um, uh, several times over the course of this process. Tom and I worked through and updated uh, we've added uh, an additional uh, option. We've uh, uh, cleaned up some of the other pieces based on new information and what we've learned so far during this. So I'm gonna start off um, and ask Ross to, to share in picture some of the things that are happening uh, in social media and in our schools. Ross? 
Good evening. Uh, you, you've heard me before share that I start my work day by looking at our hashtag <clears throat> D59Learns. We actually have two hashtags, hashtag D59Learns and hashtag D59Cares. This picture, I know they're tiny, but this is just from the last week or so. And it's just an amazing collection uh, of pictures and comments from staff. And there's a lot of excitement a lot of energy and a lot to celebrate. And I start my day every day by looking at that hashtag. I encourage you to do that as well. You don't have to have a Twitter account to do that. You can just put that right into Google or any search engine and then get a glimpse of the amazing things that are going on in District 59. I wanna thank our teachers for always taking an extra moment to share that with our learning community and our administrators. And I also wanna thank our communications department. They were out on those first few days, especially taking photos of what was going on when we started the hybrid plan. And Ben's gonna walk through a couple of those pictures now so that we can show you a visual or two that really gives you an idea of how successful the rollout has been. Or maybe 12. Um... I think that's the math. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it. Uh, so the first slide here, uh, and I do want to say thanks to Carolyn. Uh, she did a tremendous job of going out and capturing these images for us. They're just awesome. Uh, and I wanted to start off by just celebrating that uh, here you can see our, our students, from our youngest students to our oldest students, uh, are wearing their face masks. We're having good success with that. Katie will talk later on uh, just about the work we're doing to make sure that everyone understands these mitigation strategies and their importance and making sure we're having success uh, with that. But you can see here, our kids are doing an amazing job uh, with their uh, face masks. So the next slide we wanted to show you uh, just what some of these strategies also look like visually. So you can see the upper left, this is uh, our drop off line. And so you can see we're doing a, a really great job. Our staff's doing a tremendous job making sure that uh, our drop off lines, our pickup lines are uh, following our protocols. Uh, to the right, you see a classroom. So again, you see our social distancing. We're working very hard on maintaining that space and our physical uh, distancing space. The lower right, you see temps being taken as needed. That's taking place uh, in our schools, as well as the lower left where a student is using our uh, hand sanitizing stations. So our, our staff and our students are focusing a lot on sanitizing and washing their hands, washing your hands where they can. That's still our preferred method, but where you can't do that, uh, we make sure we have a lot of sanitizer available for our students. Uh, and then finally, the next slide, just to give you uh, one last picture. These are images within our classrooms. So you can see that that hybrid approach of our students who are in person, clearly I love that upper left photo. I don't know how that girl's arm could get any more excitedly raised than what it is. Uh, our students are excited to be back. Our students are definitely interacting with uh, their teachers, but also their peers. You can see in the lower right-hand corner, uh, we're still connecting with our students who are remote. Uh, so our, our staff are doing tremendous work. The, the lower left is, uh, is a teacher who's working in the hybrid. So she has students in her classroom in front of her as well as students in the computer. Uh, and uh, our staff continue to work to learn uh, how to best adapt this environment to make it work for them and for their students. And there's just a tremendous amount of praise that's due to a lot of people and the effort uh, that they're taking to make this work, uh, which is just amazing. So next we wanna hear from uh, some, uh, some folks who are, who are in the school. So I'll turn this over to Monica Farfan, who is our Claremont principal. Uh, Monica, you can go ahead and share some uh, of your reflections. Sure. Good evening, everyone. I'm just going to pull up my notes here. Um, I, I would just say overall, we've had a really smooth uh, start back to school. Um, the students have done a really amazing job. Um, you know, I remember when we first had the recommendations about being spaced apart and, and students wearing masks, and we were all thinking, how are kindergartners going to keep masks on? And um, you know, masks are not an issue. Social distancing has not been an issue. Um, our younger students are, you know, really independent and, um, and just following all the protocols. So I think it's been a really um, positive start for our students. I think they're excited. You could see, 
you know they're smiling behind those masks because um, you know they just look genuinely happy. There's you walk by classrooms and you could just tell that kids are are, are really excited to be back. And I think our, our staff is equally excited to have students uh, back in the building. What's well, a school without kids? Um, but uh, you know, and and I think flexibility has been the key uh, throughout this transition. I think we're still learning and um, every day making some small changes. Um, but overall, it's been a very successful start for the elementary school, um, from my perspective. Um, you know, as far as interacting uh, with one another, where most of our meetings are really virtual, um, and that includes uh, service providers, um, unless it is, you know, uh, necessary for, for that staff member to meet with the child um, in person. For example, uh, the psych, the social worker are having some private conversations, things of that nature, so they will meet with students. But uh, most of our meetings are virtual and um, they've been working out really well. Um, let's see here. Um, I think that one thing I've learned is I always, thought of myself as somebody who had really high expectations for our students and our staff. And, but I've, I'm still blown away with um, what everybody has done, staff and students. Um, it, it's just been really amazing um, to see the work that everybody has put in and uh, just how everybody has come together. I think that there's a shared vision where everybody wants um, what's best for kids and and you'll see that everyone's helping one another out. I think um, nobody's too big or too small for any role right now. Everyone's doing their part. You know, Larry and I are passing out snacks and that's our way to kind of get to see um, some kids. And, and I mean, everybody's doing something um, that they wouldn't you know, usually do, but it's, um, it's just how we're all chipping in. Um, I would say some other successes is, you know, although there's mixed feelings, you know, from from um, the community anywhere about, um, you know, whether or not we should return for more days, things like that. One thing that I've gotten really consistent feedback about from the parents is that um, undoubtedly our teachers are working really hard and um, and doing everything they can uh, to meet the needs of their students. So. That has been great, and um, you know, building community in a virtual setting is is not impossible, but it is a little harder. And so, I think you know, our staff takes a lot of pride in um, building that sense of community and making sure st students feel like they are part of a whole school, not just that classroom. And you know, we thought about how are we going to accomplish that when. Um, you know, especially let's say for our kindergarten students who have only met their teacher. And so we're tr just trying to do different things. We have a, a Claremont corner where, you know, weekly uh, staff are different teams are creating like a broadcast, um, uh, like a little news section and it's a little video for all the students, but it's really, um, the whole point is for us to come together. We're all doing one common thing once a week and, um, and really building that sense of community. So our students remember that all these people are here for you, not you know, just your teacher, because the teacher is definitely um, you know, they're there for them. And um, so we're making sure that we're visible uh, to our students, to our community in that way. And um, I think um, you know, our, our family days, we've been having um, Claremont family days. I'm sure other elementary schoolers are doing things to bring um, the students together. That's been something that's been really well received by our students and our staff. I continue to get comments from our staff every time we uh, have a family day, which is once a month, um, that, you know, it's, it's emotional to see everybody in one spot. Um, so that's been really great. Um, let's see, I think, um, some strategies that we've um, implemented is, uh, you know, around our MTSS structure, we continue to meet with our staff um, with every grade level every three weeks. And we make an action plan based on the needs and the successes of our students. So we're 
uh, continuously readjusting schedules to make small groups that focus on skills and strategies that students may need. Um, and oftentimes we start with, uh, you know, sometimes it's academics, but oftentimes it's really those executive functioning skills, kids who need a little more help getting organized, especially if they're at home and they don't have that um, physical support to have some of those pieces done for them at school. Sometimes we're creating things at our school um, that we're sending home that helped with, with organization um, because we were realizing that without some of those executive functioning type of skills, it's really harder for kids to access the actual academics. So we're spending um, a lot of time tapping into the key players. I think that's really been important is, um, you know, our we have whole staff meetings, but a lot of times it's getting people connected with the right people, with the coaches, with um, with Lindsey Frank, with, with anybody who, um, is an expert in each area. I think our staff has been really great about reaching out to the right people um, because we know time is of the essence. So I think uh, we're really fortunate for the resources that we have in District 59 because we have a lot of experts in a lot of areas that we could reach out to. So, um, and I would say another, you know, uh, support that we've been able to provide for students is um, check in with students who need some extra motivational support. Um, sometimes that includes some incentive plans, um, such as something as simple as a virtual lunch. They get to earn a virtual lunch with a teacher. Sometimes it's a, a tangible object of some, some sort. Sometimes it's a positive communication home, really based on um, what motivates the child. So um, I'm really uh, proud of our staff for all their work um, in this area because it's ongoing and uh, you know it, they've been really responsive to the needs of our kids. And it's really amazing that even in this type of landscape, um, how well they know their kids. And uh, so that's, that's been great to see. And um, I think now that our more students are um, in school in person, um, you know, we're making those adjustments too about what, how time should be spent for those students. Um, for example, primary grades are really focusing on a lot of writing with the kids who are in person, things of that nature, um, you know, for, because they would need um, more time um, to be able to physically see that writing and things, things like that. Um, I would say if, if I were to, I, I would say overall, it's been, it's been very positive. The one uh, biggest challenge I think is, has been staffing. Um, and it's, it's not that we uh, don't have the staff. It's just that, as you know, you know, if anybody shows a symptom, we're in cold and flu season. So people do have symptoms. Um, you know, we have to be able to cover those classrooms. And um, as you know, having a sub just in a, when we're, non-pandemic times having a sub in the classroom is not the same you know we can never replace the work of a teacher but i think that uh having a sub in this environment is really um i mean it speaks to what our staff is doing it's it's really hard it's it's really like a i know that um you know even if they do come they're uh more there for a that physical support to help manage kids pass out snacks things of that sort but we really oftentimes need to pull a resource staff member or somebody else who's a non-classroom teacher to teach that class. And so I would say that would be the biggest challenge, um, something we're working through. We haven't had any issues where we weren't able to cover a classroom. We're making it work. I think it's an all hands on deck approach, but um, it's definitely something that, um, you know, would stick out as, as something we're, we're still working on. Would it be okay to jump in and ask a question? Sure. Hi, Courtney. Hi, it's <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> we miss you at Juliet Low, but we're happy that you are at Claremont. Um, so just a question related to snack, because you had mentioned that that was the time that you kind of got out and about and distributed snacks. And I'm wondering how that is going from the standpoint of um, obviously the one time we remove masks, besides maybe like an outdoor mask break or what we might do, but how is the safety protocols around snack time 
and also wondering, particularly because you're at the elementary level, that, you know, I imagine that when snacks are passed out, not every kid can open their snack bag, not every kid can open their carton of milk. So like, how is that going for practical purposes for the teachers in the classroom? Um, so what we did is we had a lot of discussions about prepping kids. I mean, these are things you would never have to do, right? But prepping kids for that snack. So we would have a lot of conversations about how we know in our homes when we eat, it's a very social event, right? We talk, we laugh, we, we ask each other about how our day was, but a lot of teachers did, we sent out some kind of, some common bullet points that each class would discuss. And so we really want to, for the kids to know why are we having this snack and what are the common expectations? So we're having the snack to refuel because we're here for an extended time, even though it's just the morning. Um, it's an extended morning and some kids, you know, won't eat for a long time if they don't eat the snack. So we're refueling so that your brain, you know, could have more energy and, and you're ready to learn. And, um, and we're, it's just something to hold us over until lunchtime. And then, so we had discussions about, you know, honoring the fact that when we're at home or in typical situations, non-pandemic times, um, eating is a very social thing, but we really had to do that pre-teaching about how during this time, it's not a social event. It's really, we're trying to minimize um, our time, you know, off with, with masks off. And so um, a lot of, you know, uh, pre-teaching went into that. And then, um, you know, I think kids, uh, when their snacks are distributed, masks do not come off until all milks are opened if they, if, you know, in the primary grades. And then at that point is when we remove. So um, I would imagine that something similar would have to happen when we move to a lunch hour that it's not automatically you're in the lunchroom and masks come off. It has to be a little bit more, um, you know, more structured. Does that help, Courtney? Okay. Thank, thanks, Monica. I'd like to now introduce our, our middle school uh, representative, uh, John Harrington. And board members, if we want to go back in the aftermath of these two speak, uh, after they're done speaking, we can go back and ask additional questions too. So I didn't want to cut anyone off for Monica, but wanted to give uh, John a chance to speak and also uh, Ann Wang, and then uh, would be uh, happy to take a few more questions. Thanks, Dr. Pressler. Um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd want to emphasize um, just the level of teamwork that's going into this. Um, you know, I think back going back to the summer and fall, all the planning of, of every element of the building that you just had to rethink, right? How do you bring students into the building now, given our current guidelines? And, and um, you know, we were lucky that we were able to bring in in the fall some of our targeted populations and test out some of those logistics and guidelines, and that went really smoothly. Um, but yeah, it was really cathartic when we finally got to the, this transition to the hybrid model. You felt like you were going up you know, a, a roller coaster and then here we go. Um, but I think it was such a celebration in a lot of ways too, because all of this work and all this planning and slides and paperwork just to you know, try to design the building in a way that could fit the guidelines and we could maneuver safely, um, it worked. It, it really could not have gone better. Um, at least, you know, that, that initial, um, you know, our drop off and our entryways and all, our, our entry uh, procedures went really well. Um, our dismissal, the hallways, all of those things that you kind of take for granted in a normal environment, you know, how students and adults are gonna move around. Um, you really can't take those for granted. And it's a credit to the team and that's everybody. Um, teachers, custodial staff, nurses, the main office, um, I mean, everyone just pulled together. Uh, I wish you could detail all of the different ways, but um, it's a pretty amazing thing. Um, and I think that one of my other reflections from that moment, and, and, it, and it continues now, you know, with our A group students coming in today, there's, there's this constant mixture right now of, of anxiousness. You know, we're, we're coming off the bus and there's a smaller amount of, num of uh, students coming off the bus and in the hallways, and especially at a school like Grove when we're used to you know, 900 and, and uh, plus students in the hallways, and now there's, you know, 250. Uh, it's a very different experience. So there's this mixture of, of, um, of anxiousness as you're going through that. And I know this is new for the students and they're transitioning, 
but there's also this joy and you just constantly see it. Um, you see it when the teachers are, are welcoming the, the students in. Um, you see it when students see each other. I mean, there are students that haven't seen each other for months and you'll see them just sort of like bubble off of excitement and scream, you know, hi, but from six feet away. Um, and, it, you know, it's this just amazing social aspect of, of school um, is still there, albeit, you know, <laughs> significantly modified. So that's, that's a pretty awesome thing. And I think that everyone was needing that students, families, teachers was, you know, needing to have that connection again, um, as has been emphasized multiple times. Um, you know, I think we're still, as has also been mentioned, we're still learning. Um, I credit our teachers. I, I can't credit them enough with their ability to, to be creative and adapt and be flexible and, and roll with, I'm going to have students in front of me and students uh, online. And they've been amazing at, at, you know, being brought that challenge and, and overcoming it and finding, you know, new challenges and, and overcoming those and looking for resources and working together. Um, so again, I continue to come back to that, that teamwork concept. And that's really been uh, what's been able to get us to this point. There is still lots of work to do. There are still more challenges that will come, uh, but it's been, it's been really successful uh, for the most part so far. Um, yeah, I think I'll summarize it uh, like that for, for right now, but if there's any questions later, please let me know. Thank you, John. Um, and then, uh, Ann, I would love to hear your perspective on how the uh, return for in-person uh, has played out. Now, again, keep in mind, we've had kids in session, um, some of our neediest kids since the beginning of the school year as early as uh, September, but uh, just this expanded option for in-person instruction is what we're trying to build some context around. Ann? Uh, thank you, Dr. Fessler. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to you and to the superintendency team and to the Board of Education. Um, I know for myself that I feel extremely supportive uh, by you guys. Uh, we've been meeting pretty much every week since June. Um, so I just want to thank, I want to take the time and thank, um, and I hope everybody realizes that too, that I think the district is really listening and, and want to do its best for, for all stakeholders. Um, we sent out like a, a survey just like to 150 teachers from the ELC to the junior high to kind of give it a gauge of what exactly uh, the was and overwhelmingly um, at every level teachers were super excited to see the kids back. It's hard to be a teacher and not see the, their little faces in front of you. So for sure, um, the excitement that teachers had about seeing the kids was, was gin ginormous across the board. Um, I would say probably the first day of school is probably stressful for elementary and, and preschool uh, simply because they're, they're not used to the routines. And so that, um, and then a lot of them had never been to school before. So that was a little, um, that was a little stressful. Um, it was great to see students who have not connected remotely. Obviously we know that the learning environment is much better at school. Um, some of the kids that maybe weren't turning in work, uh, we can get them to turn in work now. So that's good. Um, hybrid is a great start. Uh, it allows students to transition back into in-person learning, allows us for safety measures to be in place, like social distancing, space for supplies. Um, the custodial staff is doing an outstanding job cleaning um, all of the chairs and everything that they must do during the day. So we thank them for that. Um, plus with the smaller class sizes, it allows us to take safe breaks in the building or outside uh, for small class sizes for social distancing. So we really wanna thank admin for their support on that. Um, teachers can spend time with person, uh, in-person group and give them the proper attention while balancing Zoom students. However, some, some teachers are struggling. It is difficult to do um, both online at the end, having the children in person. So that is that, that continues to be a struggle. Um, our afternoon block allows time for flexibility for teachers to meet with small groups on Zoom um, and give much needed time to full remote students. So that has been a nice to have those office hours in the afternoon so then you can circle back with some of those kiddos. Um, many teachers saw hybrid work well with everyone on Zoom at once as long as they had their headphones. However, some teachers have found projecting themselves on the screen allows students to have a break from looking at their computer screens because that's been an issue because the children have to be on their computers all day. So that's kind of nice when people are, teachers are able to project. Um, teachers feel good about being able to stay in their workstation behind plexiglass and students have been good about keeping their mask on. However, in preschool and early elementary, it's really impossible to stay three feet away because students need help with their shoes, zippers, and technology. Um, teachers have worked very hard 
I try to keep our schedule and routines constant for students. It's been, um, it, if we make more changes too quickly, uh, we could see a rise in anxiety. Arrival and dismissals are going excellent, so people are excited about that. The teachers are excited about the red cats. The mics are working great. Um, it's obvious that admin and principals and staff prepared and planned for the hybrid model that we were able for a lot of the students needs to be met, met in a safe manner. So returning to school isn't easy. Our celebrations are also attached to fear because of the risk everyone is under. Yes, it's been fantastic to see and interact with kids in person, but behind that is a very fear of what could happen could someone in the classroom be COVID positive. We need to celebrate all the hard work all teachers and staff are doing to make instruction happen this year. Whether it be from school buildings or safe at home, teachers, staff step up every day to make this work as best as they can for their students. We are all giving it everything we have and believe that our hard work and professional integrity should be celebrated. Very well said. Is this a proper time for me to make a, a comment about our education? Can I do it now? Sure, go ahead, Mardell. Okay. I've, I've been very interested in, in seeing how this new first week would come off. And I think it's come off very well from what I've seen. But obviously there are still things we have to worry about. And obviously as much as everybody has done the very best they can with the virtual, we know our students, some of them are definitely behind. I was wondering if Dr. Fessler and his SLT and and Ann Wing and her group and so forth, everybody who's been working on the in-school learning program, might look forward to the summer and decide that our summer schools should possibly be devoted to pickup of the areas for certain classes or certain ages or certain special groups where they are still so far behind that they definitely need some extra time. Rather than making our summer school what it's always been, some children who definitely need help, but the rest of it has been for other kids who would like to do fun things and more uh, excelling things and so forth. But I, I'm worried about those who are still far behind. And I'm thinking maybe this summer would be one place where we could just devote the whole summer to catch up for the most neediest of our children. And that would have to be determined by the schools. And we'd have, if we do that, we should be starting on it soon because summer will be here before you know it. That's all. That's a good idea, Mardell. I think uh, Dr. Fessler seems to have run into some technology issues. Um, he has said in uh, the weekly board reports that that is really what the summer school is likely to look, look like because we do need to catch up students who are at at, uh, you know, who have ex ex exhibited learning loss and that they are thinking of taking some of the money that we're getting from the federal government and using that to pay for part of the summer school for Title I students. So that is already um, being discussed. Correct, Mar Maureen? Yeah, and we really talked about trying to um, target those needs and kind of um, maybe a more individualized, not individuals, but small group kind of approach, kind of a what I need uh, time, but in the summer so that it is really targeted. Because sometimes even when we invite students that really need it, they're in larger classes and then it is hard for the teacher to really get to their individual needs. So what we've envisioned so far is something um, a little bit different. And like Mardell said, um, kind of more structured around the needs of the students so that we can really maximize that time. And perhaps you, we could even spread out our summer school, make it a little bit, a little bit larger than we have had in the past. If, it, if we find that there are enough children who really need the, the classwork to pass it off to as many people as possible. And then maybe we're looking at a blended approach to it. Also trying to recognize that, um, you know, we'll, whatever we come up with, we need to staff it. So um, we'll want to, you know, engage our staff um, soon, see who's interested, um, see what ideas they have so that we can make sure it's successful for students. Um, but we, that will require our staff to make that happen. We're working on it already. Mm -hmm. The um, I have a question uh, for Principal Harrington and and Principal Farfan and even and even Anne. I'd like you to, to jump into, you know, John. You made a comment about the hallways. You know, being you know you're used to having 900 people and there's 200, you know, and 50 or so. Um, 
even if we were to double that and there's 500 kids in the halls, uh, I'm curious as to how the classrooms, because I know, I know even some of the public comments we've gotten today, they talk about, you know, five kids in the classroom, but not all classrooms are the same. And I'm sure there are some that have a lot of students in there. What, what are you seeing in your buildings with the classrooms that probably have, do any have more than 10 kids uh, at a time? How are those teachers doing with, with the larger number of students um, right now? They do. I, I think that um, the class sizes really vary. Um, you know, I have a map that shows my largest class sizes for each classroom. And um, there are classrooms that have 12 students in them, and, and there's classrooms that have quite a, quite a few less. So uh, until we get to that point, we won't know exactly what those configurations will look like because it just, there's a whole spectrum of sizes um, to them. Um, you know, I think that the, what I've seen of the teachers is, um, you know, it's those same challenge that we talked about of initially, um, you know, focusing where they're going to put their focus and, and, and how they're managing that. And um, some have larger class sizes on remote and some have larger, you know, a larger group in front of them. And they're just making those decisions almost daily basis of how they might be, you know, adjusting their practice. Um, based on what they're doing, based on the class. So I think all of that really does vary. Um, I think one of the keys has been that we're really um, resting their professionalism and expertise, and we've given them a really wide uh, lane to start to navigate that as we initially get through this first step. Um, and I'm curious how we'll see that change as we, you know, as we continue on. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, um, I, um, Robert, I teach um, eighth grade social studies. So on any given day, um, I, I have like seven to eight kids in my class. If we combined them, um, for me, it'd be like 15, which I would be comfortable with. Um, but I think some of the other classes like algebra, you'd be closer to 20, 22 kids in a class. Um, and some of the classrooms, um, some of the classes are a lot smaller than others. Um, so that's going to be dependent as well. Sure. Um, I'm really hoping that we get vaccinated soon because I feel like once we get the vaccination, you know, I think we're ready to rock and roll. Um, that, that's kind of how we feel about that. But there's definitely varying and it depends on like specials, PE classes, um, and the PE classes have to share a, a space. So I don't know how much, I think it's more of the junior high issue than um, uh, elementary as far as class sizes go if you when we start combining um the a and the a and the b together well monica's <laughs> has the largest enrollment in the district so i'd like to hear from claremont as to how that's going you've got 71 percent of all students who are now in person yeah our largest class sizes and we have several classes that have 10 students so um it's definitely doable now when those teachers are um you know, doing okay with, with, with that number. Um, I do think about when, when we do go to four days, um, you know, that size will double um, in, in, in some of our classrooms. We do have a large number of classrooms who have eight to 10 kids, which will be, you know, 16 to 20 when we um, return. And so, but I, I think we're thinking creatively about how to get rid of unnecessary furniture. What can we get rid of so that we can space? So the priority is, safety and social distancing. So we're already thinking about um, how can we move around some furniture, things of that nature to, um, to make it work when, when more students return. Um, yeah, I think it's also important to remember that at our elementary schools, our class sizes are in that 20 range by and large, where at middle schools, they're closer to 30. So the 70% versus 50% could look very different just based on class sizes for those. Also keep in mind, we have about 450 kids that are already going four days. So we've identified, this is something we talked about with the board earlier. We've already identified some of our um, other needy non-special ed kids. So we have 450 kids already going four days a week uh, based on, on need. So as we we'll talk about this in the steps a little more, but we, we need to do a little more dissection of the data to see what those actual numbers are. And, 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 and one final note, the... Um... Even even when we we still haven't solved for one of the concerns that Ann raised, and she said it was a struggle 
uh, for doing the, 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 the dual, the teaching, you know, remotely and in person. Cause even when we double the class size, if you have a 30 student class size and you have 25 of those kids in person, you're still going to have those five home. The teachers are still going to have to do the double. So we still got to find, and we got to solve for that, uh, to kind of eliminate that struggle. Well, our, our model is supervised remote instruction. So, you know, they're, they're teaching one format, one approach to all kids. And that's a baseline model, Robert. So if teachers, you know, um, once they get more comfortable with, it, with this, can do more, they absolutely, and we know that we will. But that was our approach because that's what they were used to. We've been doing remote learning basically for um, the, you know, since March. It looks very, very different this school year than last school year. But again, so we would have equal access, equal opportunity for all of our kids. That's, that's our model. So kids shouldn't be getting the same thing regardless of whether they're in person or at home. It should look uh, pretty similar. The advantage to being in person is just that you're around other students, you're around the teacher. Um, you can get more attention more quickly if possible. And you don't have the uh, internet access issues that can happen at home. Um, I have a question for them basically both the principals. Um, I know one thing Mrs. Farfan brought up was the resources. You know, when teachers are coming out and stuff like that, and it's gonna be a challenge. What kind of contingency plans do we have if we do come across, you know, some resource where we can't find a sub or something like that, or we don't have a aide that can come and step in the classroom and teach? What other things we come up? Are we gonna put, you know, Mr. Gannon back in, are we gonna put Mr. Gannon back in the classroom to help out or? You might put, we might put me back in the classroom to help out. I think it's whoever, whatever it takes, you know, I think um, we, right now what we did is we paired up all of our elementary or our primary teachers with a non-classroom teacher in the first few days they spent together. And part of that was to help manage the two groups, because obviously you have a group that's there with you physically who needs, you know, help and reminders to stay distant, to stay in their spot. Um, that when you need the teacher, you don't stand up. All those things, managing those two groups, um, you know, is, is hard when you're trying to focus on, um, as has been mentioned. Um, but I think that, um, so our plan is, and we've already had to uh, use this twice, um, when a, a teacher has to um, be out of the building for any reason, our first go-to for those primary classrooms is that person who's already been in that room. So we're trying to be fair to our teachers, our classroom teachers, but also our support staff, our non-classroom teachers. And so um, we really want to make it as smooth as possible for the kids, but also for those staff members. So if I was a support staff member and I was subbing in, in so many different classrooms, it, it might be a little harder than if I know I'm always going to sub in this one particular classroom, I'm going to be the first go-to. And then of course it will happen where for some reason that day that both of those people are not available, then we would go to somebody else. So that has um, helped in our, in our primary classrooms. But I think, you know, with our ESPs, with our resource staff, with um, if need be, we would go to a special uh, choice board and even utilize one of our special staff members as a, as a sub. I do think we, we still have a lot of those non-classroom staff. When you actually look at those numbers, we do have a lot of non-classroom um, staff. Um, but I, I, you know, if, if need be, yeah, I'll go in a classroom. Larry will go in a classroom. One of our secretaries might go in a classroom. I think uh, this is a time when we show everybody that it's, we're all in. Oh, Dr. Fessler, uh, Chris Scott here. This, this chart that you're showing us right now, so these are current, these are current enrollments. When would this change hypothetically? Because it sounds like um, we're talking about hypothetical challenges, assuming we just jump from here to a full five day. Well, but, go ahead. Um, Yes, as soon as we finish this section, I, again, I, I just wanted the principals and Anne to be able to provide a little bit of perspective. Um, so often um, the board and the public only hears from the superintendent's leadership team. So we actually have you know, quite a bit of content remaining in the presentation. So um, if you can bear with us a bit, we're, uh, toward the end of the, the conversation, the, the presentation, we'd like to have an in-depth discussion about steps, consideration, timeline, et cetera. But, these next sections were just a, a couple of data slides that I've asked Tom and Katie to review just as reminders of, of protocols and mitigation strategies. 
So we can work through this content fairly quickly because um, some of it you've seen and you'll be familiar with it as soon as uh, it's, it's uh, kind of a, a reminder and then updated. And then we'll get to that discussion about steps and, ne and next steps, if you don't mind, Chris. Okay, can I ask a question, um, Jen, Ann, um, Monica? So you right now you guys have um, non-teaching staff in the classrooms. If they expand, and hi, John, I wanted to say hi. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, anyway, um, if um, we do expand class sizes, are those, and those people would have to go back to doing their regular jobs, how are you going to still be able to supplement the teacher with the, with the dual teaching going on? Is that going to be another issue? So what we did is we did that for the first four days so that they would be with the A group and the B group for a few days, A, to get to know those kids and B, to get to know that uh, teacher's routine in case they need to step in and sub. So for example, on Thursday, um, having one of our primary teachers is going to be out. So the person who's going to be subbing in that classroom is the coach who's normally in that classroom. And so we'll have... Um, but that was only the first four days. And now those non-classroom teachers are back to, because those were specials teachers, they're now teaching specials. Um, you know, the coach is now doing her, her coaching job. And so meeting with several teachers, the uh, reading resource teachers back to meeting with her students. So everybody's back to their role. So I, I would say that would be the impact is that every time I have to pull one of these people the group that the small group that they work with is impacted. So it's not without a loss that we're doing this. Um, however, I, I just don't see, you know, a, another way um, when you take an outside sub to be able to do what our teachers are doing right now is just really difficult. Um, a, it's difficult to get them to even accept the, you know, the, the subbing, but then even if they did, I just don't know that they could do what our, you know, what staff you have to be, physically there and really know how to run that classroom. And so, um, yeah, there is, there's, there's that other group that kind of then misses out on instruction, but I think we're trying to balance that out and, and it hasn't happened very often, we've just started. Um, but I think we would, our plan would be to balance that out by not always having the same person sub. So that way it's not always the reading resource teachers group that's missing out because she's constantly subbing in every single classroom. It's if that subbing is dispersed throughout um, so many of the different non-classroom teachers, then um, there's less of a negative impact on those teachers, you know, who service small groups um, outside of the classroom. Gotcha. John, Ann? Well, Pei, I think a lot of it'll depend on what the next steps look like. You know, I know there's some different, there's some different directions we can go and I think so a lot of those the impact of it will be de dependent on what our next steps really look like um, you know if it's a situation where we're combining you know as I've heard suggested a and b it really will depend on well how many are in a and how many are in b because it's not it's it's not each class is different and it, it, as you know in a junior high each class is very different right and so the when we bring them together we'll have to see what that impact is in terms of covering classes, uh, like's been mentioned, we have multiple levels of people, you know, willing to step in if we need if we need that to happen. And I think the staff has been so good about you know all, an all hands on deck approach that um, should there be an impact of someone you know unable to be in class, I think that we will be okay. Uh, but in terms of the other things of pulling people, you know, or pushing people, I guess, back into other. Uh, roles they were in, it's really going to depend on what our next steps are. Gotcha. Yeah. I was just going to say our ESPs have been a tremendous support yeah. for sure. Um, and obviously you don't want to pull, you know, the, um, the, the talent direct, you know, teacher, um, but um, sometimes that's going to happen or sometimes they might have to like divide up a class because we're, since we're doing that supervised remote, you might have, you know, in my class, two kids from, um, the teacher next door to me might come into my classroom because they just put their earphones on. Um, so obviously that's like a last resort. Um, and so far it's been, I mean, so far what I've heard is everyone has been so helpful and wonderful getting going. Now, if there's an outbreak or people get really sick, that might be a you know different story. I don't, I don't know how that would, I don't know what would happen with that then. 
And I just have one last thing I want to ask Ross. Ross, how are you? Are you seeing any more um, subs coming into play? I am going to give an update a few slides away. I don't know if Dr. Fester, you want me to wait? I'm happy to answer now. I just don't want to miss something that if we. Yeah, you can give a quick answer. I want to thank the principals and Ann for sharing that, that, that true perspective. As a reminder, this is uncharted territory for everyone. And sometimes we don't know till very early in the morning that a staff member can't come in because of the typical, my child is sick or I'm sick, or it's, I just got a call uh, and I need to quarantine. So the main goal is to run the hybrid program and to have these in-person students come to school. And as Monica shared, uh, absolutely, we're gonna have to utilize staff in a different way. The board might recall that we passed an MOU about reassigning staff. It's really, Ann and I call it the all hands on deck. And the staff really has done a tremendous job. And it has been every staff member. Principals have been in classrooms, coaches, every, everybody's been helping out. Uh, so the, 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 the subbing situation, uh, as you may know, we have a lot of subs who are, are retired teachers. Uh, they've been very vocal. They're not comfortable coming back. Uh, we have had about four or five subs in the district each day. We've been doing pretty well with some long-term positions. You know, we can get a recent graduate or a December graduate. That's been pretty stable. Um, but, you know, people are still expanding their families. People still need to have regular surgeries. And just sometimes when you feel like you're getting ahead a little bit, uh, there can be some extra needs. So if there are, are people listening, please go on the HR website, apply to be a sub. Uh, we are paying a full day rate, even though the in-person day is not a full day. And as uh, Monica shared, uh, we're trying to make it uh, reasonable. So we're not going to throw a sub in a classroom with students trying to figure out how to get on Zoom. We will more than likely move an assistant, like Monica shared, that's already been working with that teacher, move that assistant into the room, and then get the sub to fill in for the assistant. So maybe that sub then is meeting with a smaller group or helping pass out snacks. And we are also, like Ann said, combining classes or putting a couple of students in other classes where we need to as well, because the last thing we want to do is to, to cancel groups or something like that. But we have to be realistic about our all hands on deck approach to get our in-person kids in school. Thanks, Ross. Ross. Um, so again, we'll, a lot of this information um, we'll be able to, to talk and discuss more when we get to the step considerations and next steps. So um, we'll move through this, these next uh, few slides uh, a little more quickly so we can have a little more time uh, to have discussion at the end of the presentation about uh, next steps. So Tom, if you would re review the hybrid enrollment and then Katie, if you would follow up with that with the dashboard information, um, Tom. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fessler. So this uh, chart just indicates the, the current in-person and remote groups. I've been trying to share this in the Friday update and, and actually this is as of this afternoon because uh, we do see some changes sometimes on almost a daily basis. I think the key pieces, and it's already been discussed, you know, we really range from the low 40% in person to uh, over 70% uh, at Claremont. So the, the reality of that piece across the district um, and how that plays out at class size and grade levels, obviously is, is very individualized. And also, as Dr. Fessler mentioned, we have, uh, oh, 458 kids that are currently either four or five days. So that means they're coming at least Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and that definitely impacts schools in, in different ways. Actually, Rupley has the highest percentage of in-person. Um, when uh, I have uh, some different charts that I look at, it's not on this chart, but they have about 46% of their kids um, on that Thursday, Friday, because of the, the amount of full day kids they have due to the ELS program. So this basically breaks it down by each group and gives us an indication where we're at by schools. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm actually driving right now, so I'll turn it, uh, next slide, Katie. Dr. Ossel. Thank you. 
You see here a visual of our district dashboard. And last week was the first week after our completed week of hybrid instruction that we included our percentage of the in-person population that reported a positive or had a probable case over the course of the week. So from January 14th to 20th, overall as a district, we were at 0.06% um, people with positive or probable cases in the district. So far below 1%. Um, we had two cases last week. One of our schools was at 0.36%. That was the highest percentage that we saw. Um, I do expect those numbers to fluctuate. You know, those the, last week we had less cases than some of the weeks that we weren't in hybrid yet. And so I know we'll see increases and decreases. And what's important is to remember the process of what we do with this information. So we are regularly reviewing all positive cases. Today we reviewed a positive case. Um, Previously, we did a full review of a case to ensure that it wasn't connected to another, which means we're looking at dates and times and buses and entry and bathroom schedules and seating assignments. Um, so we review cases on a very regular basis. What this percentage does for us is it tells us if any one school or one building is rising in positivity um, so that we can go in and make sure that we're doing those full scale reviews and making sure that there's no internal spread occurring. And if we did find that there was internal spread, that's when we would come together working with the Cook County Department of Public Health to determine if an adaptive pause would be needed or any other types of mitigation strategies may be needed. So that's the update on the dashboard. We'll continue to include those percentages each week for every building and for the district as a whole. Thank, thank you, Katie. Uh, Maureen will walk through some of the updates for instruction. Maureen? Yes. Yes, um, just a few, I'll um, highlight a few things that are on this slide. Um, but since the last board meeting, we've had some questions uh, about how we're supporting students who may be having trouble accessing remote learning. Um, so I just wanna expand on those a bit. Obviously, as we've talked about, one of the you know more frequently used strategies currently is to have students to attend on A and B days, uh, judging from the numbers. But we also have options for supervised remote. So that might still be needed in a case where maybe distancing does not allow for a student to add students to the class on A and B days, but we still want that child in person because there are barriers to participation. Um, our virtual tutoring too is uh, something that is more recent as an option for MTSS teams to consider. Um, that is something um, to speak to the summer we talked about could be something we may continue into the summer. If we have a student that needs an intervention, um, that could be another strategy for our summer learning. Um, so these are a few of them. A new, other newer one that we were looking into, we're doing it at one junior high right now, is the use of Hapara highlights, which is something we're used to using, we just haven't used in remote learning. Um, but this is a, a, a tool that lets teachers have a little bit more uh, monitoring of what students are do doing during class and maybe structuring their online activities a little more, uh, you know, being able to kind of uh, view that and maybe control that a little bit more when needed. Some of the other things you see are our typical um, continued outreach to families to troubleshoot, see what the barriers might be and help overcome them. Um, so, and then the, um, those, those were a few of our interventions. Some of the next steps um, that the instruction team is working on um, is, is really focusing on plans for when we do expand to full day. Um, we wanted to make sure that we're ready for that when the time comes. So that's been a, a lot of the current work. We are trying to keep our start times as consistent as possible, um, ensure that we have the, uh, the contractual plan time. And we're also looking at when we do go to the full day, our blocks at the junior high will, have, will be expanded. So we'll get to experience some of the true benefits of a block schedule. We're working on those plans for lunch. Um, I know Dr. Fessler mentioned uh, to share a little bit of the challenges. One challenge that we are working through currently is at the K-5 level. Um, 
making sure that we accommodate the plan time for staff since that usually happens with specials. Our specials so far have been pretty significantly modified, but we are right now looking at uh, seeing at each school, could we resume the practice of specials being the teacher plan time so that we can keep those start and end times consistent. Um, otherwise we have to like currently because the students leave early, we can have the plan time in the afternoon. So those are things we're working through, but we are very optimistic. And of course, as we talked about already, um, summer plans. So I appreciate hearing some of the input from the board tonight about summer, because that is also tops on our list right now. Janice, may I ask you? Thank you, Maureen. Mm -hmm. Or Tom or whoever is in charge. Maureen, I just want to ask this. When we go to full day, and you mentioned full day, will we go A, F, morning and afternoon on Monday and Tuesday, and B, morning and afternoon on Thursday and Friday? Is that how the full day will work? I think that's what we're coming up on, um, Mardell. But yes, how we are envisioning the full, full day would be students would be there. Uh, you know, it, Right now, we're looking at they would be there on their assigned day. But um, I think that conversation is coming up. Thank you. Marina, a follow-up question about that. I really appreciate getting a better sense of like the breadth and depth of the different mitigation strategies. I think what I'm trying to get a handle on as well is not just the strategies that we're presenting to our remote learners, but also just knowing, you know, there's a number of kids who are not appearing live on camera, right? They're just putting up their name and we don't necessarily know, um, you know, what's going on behind the video. And then we have, you know, assignments that are either submitted or not submitted for students. And I guess I'm just trying to get a rough sense of, we obviously have attendance for, you know, are you showing up whether your video is on or not to remote learning? And I was, you know, pretty pleased to see that those attendance figures um, weren't looking severe in terms of like absences. But I think my concern is more focused on like, are we completing assignments? Um, and, and I recognize that, you know, that's a teacher by teacher question. Um, so, so if you could start, and I don't know if any of the principals or Anne has insight, but I'm just trying to get a sense of like, we have students who are participating, but are they turning in their assignments? Are they doing the work? And is this a significant gap, um, you know, that that is kind of going under the radar at all? Yeah, I think that the, it, it, that's a little bit more challenging data to collect, but, um, you know, we can check to see if there's a way to do that centrally or else we could do it school by school. We would have to just kind of use a self-reporting type of mechanism. Um, but I will check to see if there's a way to pull that from Skyward, unless John or Anne um, happen to know, I know they're a little bit more um, well, I think users of Skyward. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's definitely children who aren't doing anything. Um, I don't, like I was thinking, I think sometimes as a teacher, you get frustrated, even if it's like 10 kids, like I see 75, like 75 kids a day I, I typically see. And it's frustrating when you have 10 kids who aren't doing anything. Um, and I know um, when my partners and I, we sat down and we looked at the data, it wasn't like half the class. Most of the children, I would say 90% of the kids are engaged in doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but there's that percentage that, and that's, I think as a teacher, that's hard, it's a hard pill to swallow because typically if we were in session, um, you could pull the kid you know, or, you know, I've, I've sometimes I've waited after their ninth period class to be like, come on, you got to stay with me after school today. And obviously you can't do that kind of stuff. Um, so that's been hard uh, to swallow. But it, it, I think overall, though, it's not as significant as we think. It's just, I think it's just as a teacher, it's just hard when you see children who aren't, um, who aren't doing anything and, and you, you know that this is hurting them and you feel like you, there's nothing you can do. So that's that's been difficult for sure. And I think that's probably across the board for everyone. I appreciate that, Maureen and Ann. Thanks for sharing. And I guess, Ann, can you give us any sense of like in those scenarios, is there like a uniform process for how teachers reach out if like no assignments have been turned in? I mean, I realize there's only so much you can do with like radio silence, 
for example, but um, what does that look like if like a remote learner is, you know, maybe showing up with their camera turned off, but you receive no assignments? Um, well, typically what we would do is um, sometimes I've like just said, hold on kids. And I run and I call, like you call the parent while we're in class. Uh, we've done stuff like that. Um, emails, phone calls home. Uh, I know my principal has done at home visits with some of these kiddos. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, I know we've reached out with our, um, you know, um, they hired all those interventionists and things like that. So they're, they've been pulling the kids and working with those, uh, those kiddos. So like at the end of every quarter, we're kind of looking at that data, you know, who isn't coming on a regular basis and who isn't doing their work. Um, and then we're just kind of, we're trying to problem solve, like what else can we do? We've, we have done X, Y, and Z. So I think it's like, I know for myself, like I've called, I know my the school counselor has called, I know my building principal has been at these people's homes. Uh, so those are the things that we have done. No, I appreciate that a lot. And I'm also encouraged. I mean, I'm, I'm not encouraged that you have 10 students that don't participate, but I, I am somewhat encouraged that that's a relatively low number considering the amount of independence we're expecting of some kids who are completely unsupervised in some instances. So yeah, thank you for the, for the thoughts. Hi. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, Katie, uh, can you highlight the mitigation return planning phase, yep. please? Yep. So as you heard um, earlier in the presentation, our first days went very smoothly. Um, our self-certification is something that has gone really well, but we need to continue to improve upon. On, um, on any given day so far, we've had between 65% and 85% of expected parents complete their self-certification, um, depending on the building. And so we still are, are strongly encouraging our parents to make sure that they get that in on time so that our, our entry goes smoothly because the, the more kids we have self-certified, the less temperature check and symptom screenings we need to do. Now, even with that, we had a really smooth process for that temperature and symptom screening at every building. Everyone was able to maintain social distancing while that happened and, and move into the building fairly quickly. We are working with just a couple of parents to support the very few students who, who struggled to keep their mask on over their nose. The vast majority of students came with masks prepared and were able to maintain that with no problem. So we've seen very few cases and we're working in partnership to make sure that we support those students so that they've got that process down and are able to, um, to be consistent with that mitigation strategy. We also have been able to maintain six feet of social distance within our classrooms because we are in that hybrid model. So even with larger classes that we talked about earlier, we still have that social distance in place. And we are practicing our exclusion procedures. So when we have a positive case, when we have someone who needs to quarantine siblings of those who are symptomatic, we're working through all of those exclusionary criteria to make sure that we are um, we are maintaining the health and the safety of those in the building by uh, making sure that anyone who may present a risk is home and taking care of themselves. We've also done a great job with hand washing and sanitizing. I had the joy of working with a kindergarten class on day one, and I expected to teach everyone how to wash their hands at the classroom sink, and they all came in ready to go and singing ABCs and happy birthday and maintaining their 20 seconds. So it went really well. Um, so there are some things here that we need to continue to improve upon, but overall our mitigation strategies are in place and very successful. Where we're shifting and focusing our, our full attention right now in health, wellness, and safety is on vaccination planning. So I'm going to take a moment to talk about what we've done and where we're at. Um, on Friday, we sent out a message to our staff in the weekly update, asking them to make sure that they're signing up with their local health department to receive information on vaccinations. We know that suburban Cook County, the vaccination process is certainly not going as fast as we would all like to see it go. Um, it is possible that in other counties, the vaccination will be made available to educators earlier. We've even seen some get started in this past week. So some of our staff that live outside of Cook County could be signing up with those counties to get that information. 
Today, we sent a message to staff about the Cook County sign up for information um, that includes both those who live in Cook County and those who work in Cook County. So all of our staff should also be able to receive updates on vaccination avail av availability from our local health department as well. And um, really, we're just taking the approach of let's take every opportunity we have available to us because the reality is we don't know when the supply of vaccines will come in and where it will go first. And so we wanna make sure that we have every availability for our staff to receive one of those vaccines as early as possible. Another piece that we're spending quite a bit of time working on is a partnership with all of our District 214 feeder schools. We are working with Dave Schuler to, to think through how we could potentially have sites dedicated just to providing vaccinations for educational personnel within that cooperative of schools. So we're looking at things like sharing human resources, bringing our nurses together to distribute vaccines if they are available, um, working on registration and how we can kind of pool our resources to have um, a vaccination center just for educational personnel. So that is another option that we're pursuing. We don't know that that will happen, but you know, the thought is that if we can create a very solid plan and present that to Cook County, they may be able to supply us the vaccines, which we can then distribute. And that may happen in a quicker manner. So we truly are pursuing every option to make sure that our staff can get vaccinations as early as possible. Um, the trick is just knowing when that supply will be available um, and who it will go to first. And that's fully dependent on the local health departments. Thank you, Katie. Next, we'll look at the operations update from uh, Ron and Ross. The transportation, currently the district has run 81 transportation routes between Grand Prairie and First Student. Companies are still facing driver shortages. Uh, the district does continue to deliver students with assigned seats, as well as requiring masks for each student and staff. There are up to 25 eligible students on one route. However, we've seen much lower counts along the lines of about 10 students when it comes to actual riders per route. Food service is working with our vendor, Organic Life, so we can study what has worked in other districts. All students have had an opportunity to receive meals, but not everyone takes what is offered. So we are looking at the number of bus riders versus the number of walkers so that meals are strategically placed in areas where students will exit. The district does order food the Wednesday before, so we are prepared to feed the kids. Funding and reimbursement for food service is currently covered. Before the school food service program, summer program kicked in, there were more emergency purchases to get meals to students, so it wasn't covered up until August. Any remaining dollars that we've received, though, can be reimbursed through the stimulus dollars if need be. As for the stimulus expenditures, the district is receiving almost four times the amount of dollars compared to the first round of money that was dispersed last year. Summer programming can be supplemented with our stimulus dollars, as we mentioned earlier. The $3.8 million will be helpful as it may be used for technology, additional masks, place masks, uh, placemats for uh, easier cleaning, trifolds, plexiglass, other materials, that because we're gonna be diligent on the needs of each building, maybe hand sanitizing, our MERV 13 uh, filters and other supplies. In terms of staffing, our goal remains the same. It's to open our schools for students and families while supporting staff. Uh, it, it does seem to be a moving target. Things and conditions are changing all of the time. We've been lucky. We've been able to hire some positions. As you know, we've had some temporary positions up. Uh, we've had some success there. That's with custodians, with nurses, with teaching assistants. But then we have also had some resignations and leaves of absence. Um, two resignations recently were from our nursing team. So that can have a dramatic impact on our ability to move things forward. We would love to have every position filled with a couple temporary extras right now. Leaves of absence, we're, we're supporting staff if they need to take a medical leave. Some staff, again, are at a place in their career where they can retire. And for different reasons, uh, the time is right for that to happen now. 
whether that's medical or, or leave of absence. Uh, quarantines can, can still happen. They come with, without a whole lot of warning. Uh, but again, we've shared this many times, but I don't think we can share it enough. Our staff has been tremendous, so flexible, so patient. Um, and that's everything from our cameo staff. They're, they're, they're making more barriers and, and protective shields. Uh, our custodians are moving to different buildings to cover uh, our staff we've already highlighted. I also wanna highlight the Ad Center team. This team's been coming back since summer and uh, we're, we're pretty shorthanded here as well at times. And they are keeping every single behind the curtain thing running. Um, you never see it, uh, but boy, do you feel it. <laughs> and it's, it's truly amazing. Again, our substitute pool, um, it's, it's where most are, um, but uh, we're, we're hoping that as shots become more available uh, and uh, people feel more comfortable in the community, we'll be able to, to start utilizing that a bit more. The last update I wanna share is uh, President Biden's American Rescue Plan. We're starting to hear more about how that could impact schools. Some of the things we're hearing is that, uh, you remember me talking about the Family First uh, Coronavirus uh, Response Act, FERCA? Uh, President Biden's plan could bring that back and expand upon it. So something like that could come with very little warning and have a dramatic impact on staffing. So again, we're, we're taking things day by day, week by week with the goal of opening schools for <coughs> students and families while supporting staff every step of the way. Thank you, Ross. So um, you may see me picking up my cell phone once in a while. I'm um, navigating tomorrow, uh, conversing with other superintendents about the weather out there. So it seems to be pretty good right now. So as of now, we're still a go for, for school tomorrow, but uh, we'll revisit it for 5 a.m. So anyone who's listening, teachers, families, that's kind of our plan uh, as of now. Um, so back to the presentation, next steps. Um, again, we'll continue to monitor the in-person and data. As Tom shared, um, the primary and we're aligning and the Department of Health, the Cook County Department of Health when necessary. Staff know that if they can their own Cook County, other counties, Having county large, and it's really Dr. Fessler. You know, it's, the audio is really. Dr. Fessler, your audio is breaking up. You might want to uh, uh, shut down your video and see if that helps. Just turn off okay. your video. I'm glad you just discovered what it was. I thought there was something wrong. <laughs> I couldn't even tell who was talking. No, oh, and now he's frozen. Yeah. Um, is anyone else uh, familiar? Oh, there. Art, are you there? Can you, can you, can you hear me? You're still breaking up. Is there somebody on the call that um, has knows where this is right now? And can yeah, I can in? I can jump in. Art, just interrupt if if you get back to so. Um, Thanks, Tom. Just uh, the next steps, uh, as Dr. Fesser was outlining, we'll continue to monitor data, especially the data internally. Um, we're pursuing as many vaccination opportunities as Dr. Ossel outlined. Um, hiring of staff, subs, nurses, all these plans are rolling from a day to day. As Maureen mentioned, you know, working on schedules, the, as, as Ron talked about the meal pieces, um, looking at that full day model, working on transportation and food service. Um, we are starting to already plan ahead to spring break. And you've probably seen some of the travel pieces that are out there. Uh, we're planning some uh, communications to families that if they're, they're gonna travel, uh, what that could look like when they return. Um, you know, there, there's nothing that prevents someone uh, but from having to quarantine, but uh, I think we'll have some strongly uh, referenced ideas to if you're going to travel to to be as safe as possible that's a why we've done so well i think our families and our staff have done a great job we want to continue that and and then you know this next piece is really the next steps uh process that uh, you might remember this uh 
slide from earlier, we've updated it um, and modified a little bit. Currently we're at step three, uh, the two days per week hybrid uh, with the remote option. As far as we know, the, that remote option um, has to remain in place. Currently that's the requirement from the state. Uh, our assumption is that will remain in place likely for the rest of the year. So as we talk about um, you know, what the future could look like, um, the, the first things I'll just jump over really quick and talk about external and internal considerations. Um, you know, we haven't had a lot of direction from the governor since last spring when he really did shut down schools. Um, I don't think we're expecting the governor to step into these next steps, but there's always that could happen, especially if the numbers change locally or throughout the state. Um, we continue to look for guidance from ISBE um, and direction from them. Uh, the, both the state, the Illinois Department of Public Health and Cook County Departments of Health, looking at guidance from there. And then that key piece, I think that's been mentioned multiple times, vaccinations, uh, vaccinating staff um, as a big part of an external consideration. Uh, we're doing everything we can to make that happen, but we don't control it. Uh, internally, uh, has, been, has been highlighted many times, uh, the mitigation strategies, mass, social distancing, self-certification, are ongoing. Uh, we did want to highlight, and I think it was mentioned a few times, that ability to maintain appropriate social distancing in classrooms as kids and students return, whatever those numbers look like. You know, our 3% internal positivity uh, tracking that we're looking at, really that piece would trigger additional conversations. So we're collecting that. You know, our, we are collecting it every week. We're going from Thursday to Wednesday of every week. That's our way of, of hitting those, the A and B group and really see how things are playing out across schools. And then has been, also has been mentioned the staffage and coverage pieces. So uh, I'll just jump right to that step four. You know, as we're looking at next steps, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, basically two options within step four. Uh, half day, the, the half day hybrid that would move to a four days a week. That's our situation now. Uh, we're four, four hours is more than a half day, but basically uh, looking at taking this current model from two days to four days. Um, or another potential option is taking the, the current model and making those full days. So group A, let's say Monday and Tuesday goes from four hours, stays two days, but goes five and a half hours a week. Um, we'd have to serve lunch or we'd, we'd look to serve lunch in that, in that model. Those are kind of those two next pieces. Five and six we've had on the table throughout. Um, you know, our, our assumption as we move down the road, you know, expanding uh, uh, the hybrid to a four day, full day option, and then finally getting back uh, to a five day uh, in person per week uh, option for kids and families. So Tom, can I, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. My internet just completely crashed. Um, Glad you're back. Yeah, thank you. So really wanted to focus on, on number four. So um, as you know, we're currently in step three. Um, I think another thing to consider is that we don't have to do the same thing at the high school and the elementary. So let's just say, for example, I mean, there's a, there's a big concern that since we don't have the vaccination yet, that having, having max, masks off for extended periods of time during lunch um, could be a challenge. So, you know, one possibility could be to go to the hybrid half day, four days a week at the elementary where our class sizes are a little bit more reasonable versus the middle school. And we may just want to hold on the middle school until a vaccination is available, available and then we can extend there. Um, or we, if, if the board feels it's appropriate, we could look at the uh, junior high school doing the hybrid full day, two days per week AB, but that would um, you know, cause us to have uh, lunch at the middle school. Um, you know, again, the challenge is we don't have any reliable information in terms of when we'll get the get vaccinations uh, for our staff. We know that today was the first day they were available for 1B, but there were no appointments uh, available that Katie could find in Cook County. Um, so that that is a concern to us. I know it's a concern to staff. In my conversations with Ann, it's a concern to her. So. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of direction, it's hard for the board to give us direction right now with that significant uncertainty. 
One thing that we could uh, look at doing um, though is considering elementary um, at that uh, four day a week, half day hybrid um, where we're you know, averaging uh, you know, 12 to 14 students in most schools. The sticking point would be at Claremont though, because those class sizes would be a little more significant and uh, we'd have to do a little more research to see if we could offer that at Claremont. Uh, we feel pretty confident that at most other schools we could, but again, we would want to do a little more research. Um, and, and again, the one piece that is a little challenging is that we have 450 kids already going four days. So we don't want to double count some of our students when we look at what a class size would be. So um, that's, that's where we're at with our thinking that some type of a combination of that number four and then trying to figure out what timeline um, we would want to try to pursue uh, recognizing that uh, we're still waiting for information about the vaccination. Now, keep in mind, we do have uh, spring conferences coming up. So a break in that uh, timeline might be good. Um, Maureen, when are conferences? Is it February 9th? I believe it's the 10th and 11th. It's a Wednesday 10th, and Thursday. 10th and 11th. So we have a board meeting. I think, I think our next board meeting is February 11th. Um, so, um, we know that we need two weeks for food service and for our, um, transportation to make any updates that would allow us to do a, a full, um, bus schedule, whether it be half day or full day. So that's, uh, where we're at. So now we'd like to open it up for discussion and questions, uh, with the board. Uh, Dr. Fessler, this is Janice. Um, our board meeting is on Monday, February 8th. Okay. Thank you. And um, my question would be, if, and I, I think I posed this to you quite a while ago, if we were able to bring in kids four days a week for half days, but it wasn't, we weren't able to do that at Claremont, isn't there going to be an equity piece involved with that, that we're not able to give the same opportunity for all schools? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. Um, I know other school districts are doing similar things um, that they go, you know, based on capacity and the ability to social distance. So again, that would be a challenging decision that the board would have to make, or we would have to really look closely at the numbers in Claremont and see if there's uh, any way to utilize our state, our space differently, or we might look at a three day rotation versus a four day rotation if possible. Okay. I have a comment regarding the vaccine. Um, I, you know, a thought I had, just thinking outside the box, Jewel Osco is one of the pharmacies that is distributing the vaccines where you could try to make an appointment online and there are no available times. Their headquarters is in Itasca. You know, it, it, can we reach out to their headquarters, maybe develop some type of partnership with, with them as far as a partner for vaccinations? I'm sure their marketing department would love that. Well, um, we absolutely can. I know that many school districts are already doing that. Um, you know, Walgreens has partnered with many of the North Shore school districts and, and they're um, setting up vaccinations for as early as next week. We've been working uh, with, um, with uh, North Cook uh, Intermediate Service. We've been working with uh, 214 um, and any other um, um, groups that will, will you know, make availability for vaccinations. We've not reached out directly um, to those groups and, and are not opposed to it. Um, but again, most, many school districts have, have been trying to do that as well, Robert. So that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a good suggestion. Meyer is also scheduled to be an Illinois 1B provider. Um, I haven't had any luck with appointments with them either. I don't know that they're actually there yet, but that's who we're anticipating being kind of our, our big opportunities is either with North Cook and District 214, um, with Cook County, with Jewel, or with Meyer. There are just a lot of competing interests. I think I heard that there are only 4% of doses available for the 1B um, um, identified people in Cook County. <clears throat> I know I tried to um, get an appointment today in, on the Cook County site. There were some available in Tinley Park, <laughs> but by the time I got signed up, they were gone because that's how fast they were going. But um, those were, that was like around noon. So they must have had a good deal this morning um, that just were gone because there were like eight sites. Um, 
across Cook County where you could get um, an appointment. And they were going all the way up to February 6th right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause ideally, you know, we uh, want to avoid, you know, the staff kind of fending for themselves and fighting in line to, to, to find these vaccines and having pockets that just aren't able to do it, you know, while others can, you know, once it becomes more available. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that is really exactly why we're trying to work with the other districts to see if we can kind of come up with our own plan to make things happen in a more consistent way. Hi, Professor. This is Chris Godlevich. So just um, on our timeline here, the, you and your team are comfortable with moving to step four. Can we take action on that if everyone agrees and comes to a consensus today to begin that step four rollout, however your team executes on it, whether it's a difference at the, at the junior high level versus elementary, um, to go live on the 11th? Or would we reconvene again for another discussion on the 8th to go live at the end of the month? Can you walk me through the mechanics that you had in mind? um, I think we need to do a little bit of research, but you know, I I think if if we look at the numbers um, for um, four, call it 4B for the, um, the, I'm sorry, the 4A, the half day hybrid at the elementary school, I think the majority of our schools could make that work. I think what I would wanna do is, contact every school, look at the actual class size, find actual numbers and send that report to the board um, as soon as this Friday to show the actuals to see if it's something that we can do. Um, and that's something if, if the numbers work and we can socially distance, we could become operational with that by the 11th. Um, because again, we need two weeks um, for preparation with transportation and with food service, but we could certainly give them notice today to start getting uh, to work on that. And if we have to cancel, we have to cancel. Um, you know, for the, for the middle school, again, it's a little more challenging because some of our class sizes are, are much larger. Um, you know, and, and we've heard many people comment that they feel like they've got a pretty good routine going with, with the model at the middle school. So I wouldn't be as comfortable making a recommendation to the board. However, if the board feels strongly about wanting to do something uh, in addition at the middle school, um, you know, we've got, we've got the plans and the, the availability to do it. I just think again, uh, with the numbers at the middle school, particularly at, at friendship and, um, Grove, which are significantly larger than homes, some of the class sizes could be, could be, could make it a, a little challenging. Um, so, so that, does that answer your question, Chris? So, uh, I, yes, I, uh, that answers my question. So now I would just ask, you know, my, my, peer board members how we all feel about saying yes to moving to 4a or 4b in time for 211 and then uh dr professor and his team if there's data that shows us otherwise that we can always pull it back but you know notifying um the transportation company and and um the the processes for feeding the kids to continue to delay that while we discuss um, adjusting this, I think is just delaying, you know, creating, doing business for the kids and getting them back into fuller days, or at least progressing as we talked about in the last board meeting. Um, I'd like to make a couple of points. One is that um, I think that it's less important for the junior high students to be in school. um, So I'm okay with that. Um, But I really uh, do think that uh, just to remind you that we cannot take a vote on this and we don't need to um, because we cannot take action unless it's been posted and it wasn't posted, but we can indicate our support for that, that action or that, that strategy. So I'm okay with doing um, half days, four days a week, assuming we can work it out and uh, do something creative for um, Monica's crew over there. Um, and I'm disappointed that we couldn't go to full days next just because um, I think it's easier on parents to have the full day and not have to worry about pickup in the middle of the day. Uh, However, uh, because of the uncertainty about um, serving uh, lunches, I'm okay with going four days per week. I'm sorry, I had some major internet connections. I lost everybody for about 10 minutes. Let me start over. Just yeah, please. Yeah, wait, wait, let's go back. Let's go back to our, no, um, can you, can you just kind of rephrase? So we're looking at 4A, 4B now, 
And we're talking about going to four days, half days, or not, and not, and not going to the full days. Correct. Okay. Can, can, can you explain the lunch thing to me just real quickly? Because that's, that's a, I, I figure that's a big sticking point right now. That, that's correct. That, that's why the recommendation um, until we get the vaccination is to stay in that half day hybrid, but expand from two days to four days at the elementary school, um, understanding that we're going to have to look at some pockets of enrollment that may be impacted and, and make sure that we can do that at all the schools. There may be a chance that we cannot do that at all the schools or in all the classrooms, but we would have to look carefully uh, at the impact at uh, Claremont to see if we can socially distance our classes. And then we indicated... I Go ahead. Sorry. We indicated that at the middle school, um, we would primarily stay the same. I would suggest again that we we look at um, opportunity opportunities to expand to four days for some, if possible. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to do that, but I would like to work with the the middle school administration to see what possibilities exist. And I think we had shared a few times now that we have 450 kids that are already going full day, um, and some of that is based on need. And we could, you know, broaden our parameters of need at the middle school if, uh, if we deemed uh, that was appropriate, which I think it would be. I think so that's I, a great I idea. Have, I'll have a follow-up question then. Um, if we decide to go with the elementary kids going the four days, and then the junior high still stay in the, with the A B, how is that going to work? We know that parent it'll be struggled for parents because it'll be half days and you know, picking up kids and stuff like that. But also, some family, a lot of families will read. Um, rely on their junior high kid who theoretically watch and help with their elementary kids. Is that? Well, the, the, you know, the, the piece, that's a great question, Randy. The piece that we could also, you know, that, that is a strength of our program is we're in supervised remote learning. So, um, you know, we've not discussed this, but I think we would have some flexibility. So if kids can't come on a certain day, if they log in, we're still doing attendance, um, you know, they would be marked as present, even, even though they're not there physically, if they're signed up for that AB. Um, so that, that would be something I think we could actually work through pretty cleanly. Cause again, um, with our supervised remote learning, you know, all kids are getting the same experience in terms of the instructional content, whether they're in person or remote. Art, okay. this is Janice again. I have a question about um, what I brought up before about equity in the classroom. So could we get uh, some information from what other districts are doing and a legal uh, uh, opinion on what would happen if we just couldn't do it at say some sections at Claremont, but yeah, we I've, could do it. I've got a legal opinion on that, on that already. I've already talked to Eris about that and we are able to do that. Um, okay, all right. So, Cause I, so yeah, I thought I'd asked you that before. Yeah, we have to make every effort to, to try to do that. But um, if we have and we can't, then we are able to do that. Thank you. I, I think if I can comment and make a probably another comment after that, I think our, our goal throughout this entire process has been to reopen the schools and get the kids back as fast as possible. I think it's very easy for us to stand here and say, yes, this is easy. Let's do it. Let's open. Um, but uh, with four days a week, you know, that option, that 4A, if, if Dr. Fessler and his team can look into that and it can be done, then yes, let's support that. It, it should be that the, the, the district and the staff comes, you know, presents and says, yes, we can do this successfully. We can do it safely. Then, then I would support that if, if the four days a week. So if that, you know, analysis and, you know, you guys can look into that and report back to the board. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. And, um, you know, this, this is a newer concept. So um, I've shared it with Ann, but she's not had a chance to really react. And I'm, and I also know that Ann's at the middle school. So elementary teachers will share their feedback on this as well. So we will have some reaction to this and that's a, that's a, a good point, Robert. And we can share that uh, information this week. I mean, we can plan like we're going to do it, but we can also say, Hey, here's some things we didn't think of. Here's some unintended consequences. Right. And that might also um, impact the board thinking. Yeah, because I think it's good, Dr. Fessler, to be flexible with, you know, one size doesn't have to fit all. And the elements, you know, like Janice said, it's, it's more beneficial for these younger students to be there in the classroom with the teachers. The older kids are probably used to, you know, learning on their own and, and doing their kind of independent work. Um, so, so we can have that flexibility. But I just want to make sure that, that, that it can be done right, it can be done safely, uh, and that it's the best decision for, for these kids. Janice, this is Mary Dale. I'd like to second what Robert said. I think this is very important because I don't want to give the 
parents a confusing message saying that we're making any determinations tonight because we've only been in in school learning for one week i think our next meeting is coming up or one and a half or two or whatever it is but um the point is it's very new yet to us and we could hear from marna Carthy and when she spoke about all the different possibilities that they are using their staff for in order to get this to work so i think we should give the administration enough time to investigate all of this and make sure that it's right because our next meeting is coming up in just a couple of weeks we can talk about it then and make decision and i think just tagging off of both Robert and Mardell, that also gives us, we had some public comment requests for at least two more weeks of data. And mm -hmm. I think that will be meaningful and important to see, okay, these you know, five cases that have been mentioned, do we see any subsequent in-school transmissions? How does it go as we you know, go beyond our third and fourth times of having you know, the group A and group B? Um, and then I think we'll have you know, the groundwork by the administration to explore and research, we'll have a little bit more data under our belts, and then we can, you know, be poised to move on this, should the research, the opinions and the numbers, you know, support that. Yeah, of course. Um, I want to take clarify something with Dr. Assel. When I looked at the data in the spreadsheet, there's only been two cases that I saw in your database of, I. Uh, children that are infected at school. It's not five, right? It's only two. Um, as of January 20th, when we did the data on Wednesday, there were two cases, one student and one staff. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Also, can you clarify, like, as of today, how many cases? Um, I just did a look at the beginning of our meeting, um, and it looks like we have five cases so far. Okay, so that may be where that number came from. Yeah, and I also want to just clarify that um, from the parents' point of view, you know, they're receiving letters if there's a positive case, um, a, a letter that states there was a positive case in your child's school. We've notified close contacts. We want you to be aware. Um, sometimes we have staff that are shared between buildings as well. So if two buildings get notices, that could be one positive case for a staff member that goes to two buildings. So, um, so you know, it's it, there's lots of nuances to the data. We try to keep it as absolutely consistent as possible, but that is something to consider as well. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dr. Russell, one of the comments in today's public comment mentioned the difference between notifying parents when there's strep and notifying parents when there's COVID. Do we send letters when there's strep or is it the, a different process? You know, I would have to check with what exactly the strep process is. I have, I have not dug into that in my COVID plan, sure. <laughs> but I can find out for you. Thank you. Um, and, you know, Robert, I also want to follow up. I have been communicating with our health coordinator, De Denise Webster, um, who informed me that they have been in communication with Jewel Osco um, okay. about vaccinations for educators, and they would be absolutely willing to work with us However, the, the trickle, the, the slow um, speed with which we're, they're getting vaccines, it's not fast enough to actually work with a full group at this point. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're that that's going to speed up to the point where they could look at groups and then we could form that partnership. Sure. Um, so I kind of, I do like, I like the way of proceeding forward. Um, I. I think we should, in my opinion, I mean, I was completely here to support the full day twice a week, AB um, with the lunch. Um, actually, I think it's more of a win-win for students, actually for elementary kids, that elementary kids will actually get more in classroom time for those that'll be in there by going the four day half day. So I'm, I am in favor of that as, you know, as a definitely alternative because it's more classroom time yeah. for our young kids, which definitely need it. Um, I think I need to add that I think we should proceed with kind of like almost start notifying the um, lunches and the bus bus company now that we would like to proceed in a couple of weeks, just because, you know, the longer we wait, you know, the farther these kids are, you know, the more time it takes, you know, we're already, you know, right. We're already, but three or four weeks into the next, into the second semester, meaning there's not many school days left before kids get out at the end of May. If we delay 
any more than a couple more weeks. We're almost into March. We got a week for spring break. And then we're, you know, basically out of school. So that's my, that's my personal opinion and my thought. Okay. Dr. Fessler, Chris Godlevich here. So how do you feel uh, so far as, you know, our support as a board and, and, you know, taking the next steps? Um, yeah, the direction that I've heard is to do some follow-up on the discussion today, proceed with, um, like we have the intent and in, um, going to f the four half days on February for a February 11th start. I believe it's a Thursday. Um, and then we're going to examine other opportunities at middle school, but we want to certainly get that feedback that you guys suggested from um, the different stakeholder groups. And I do think we can provide some flexibilities for families at the elementary level. So, um, you know, if, if, they, if they don't want to do the four full days, they can just choose the two. We'll just have to investigate and see how we can do that smoothly uh, within our school. So I do think we have some flexibilities even within the model um, to address some of the concerns. I think Randy may have expressed the concern about the middle school being a little different and the flexibility um, that it provides. Okay, I have no problem with um, doing two separate, like the, the junior highs, because they do have the higher numbers. I still want to hear the information from you guys that you find before I am 100% on board. So whatever you guys find, Art, or if that's what I want to hear first. Okay, yeah, I'll have a full update by the end of the week. Okay. Well, I think it goes without saying that we have to make sure that um, you know, everything else is working successfully in order for us to move forward. So that's, I think I, that's important. I agree. Okay, can I, um, I was looking, I just looked at the district calendar and February 11th is a no school for attend for students, afternoon conferences, schools closed on the 12th and we're closed on the 15th for President's Day. Am I reading that correct? Yeah, though that is conference times, Randy. I was going to jump okay. in. The tenth and eleventh are conferences. So, so but there was like no student attendance on the eleventh and twelfth, correct? Dr. Fessler, I think you should take all of these suggestions, including the calendar update, make sure of all the dates, and look it over and talk with all of the different parts of your committee, and then come back to us at the next meeting, and we'll be ready to do something. I'm still trying to get my question answered here, though. So February 11th, I see on our calendars no student at school attendance. So why are we talking about getting bringing the kids back? I don't, I don't, Randy, I don't have a calendar in front of me. I thought the 11th was the day after conferences ended. So if that's the case, it would be the, um, tu the Tuesday after President's Day. Okay, so that 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 seems more reasonable than that. Great, thanks. Yeah, and I mean, just to point out, that would be over a full month after we went back on January 14th. So I think that gives us like a full month of data. And I guess Dr. Fessler, I don't need the answer to this now, but in that Friday update where you share numbers, I'm interested in knowing what you consider that number of a max class size, recognizing maybe it varies depending on yeah. you know, what six feet is and the parameters of a particular classroom. But I'm just wondering like what that max number we can take in each class is and, and you know, how we determined that. Yeah, and I, and I think you know we did that study early on as we were planning, so we'll be able to we'll be able to get that information. And you are correct that uh, it, throughout our schools, classrooms have different sizes, and our goal is to maintain. We're, we're hoping to maintain a, a six foot um, social distance, but please keep in mind that you know in the in the recommendations that were provided earlier. And Katie, please remind me if it was CDC or IDPH. You know they indicated if you have of appropriate mitigation strategies in place, it can be three to six feet, but six feet is the, the golden standard. But um, just keep that, that in mind. Um, you know, I think in District 25, they took, they, they moved to um, even reduce it beyond that. So in some of their classrooms, so people are approaching it differently. Uh, we certainly uh, have been very safe throughout this and want to continue to do that. So um, we'll, we'll revisit those, uh, that information and uh, we'll link that to the Friday update as well for the board to, to take a look at. I do Thank think that's you. something that we may want to have a further discussion that, um, you know, if the vaccine is not coming in a timely manner, and it's my hope that our, our staff are fully vaccinated before we leave for spring break or by the return of spring break so we can, you know, visit options beyond that, we may want to look at that, uh, revisiting that conversation again. I think that makes sense, but I do want to 
try to make sure we have clear guidance and expectation setting for staff and families. So putting out something about tonight's discussion might make sense so that everybody is understands where we are. I think that's a good point because it could be that the parents ha would have a preference whether they want their children to go four half days or two full days. And I think with the working parents, they might go for the two full days in, 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 first, in their first preference, but I don't know that But until we let the parents tell us what they would prefer. Well, that wasn't what I was suggesting, but that's certainly something that the, the administration can consider. I was simply saying that uh, the outcome of this uh, discussion should be uh, published so that, you know, there's no confusion with anyone as to what we're looking at and why. All right, you're, you're muted. Yep. I've got, I've got the direction. Uh, I understand, um, you know, keep in mind that we have informed parents that when we make a, uh, a change in our approach that we will allow them also to change their preference if they'd like to. So all those things will be included. Uh, we'll get to work on that stuff as part of our uh, board update and try to provide a, a clear and concise um, summary of what was discussed and agreed upon tonight in terms of next steps. So thank you for the feedback and the direction. Um, feel good about um, what the board has shared with us tonight. So thank you. All right. Let's hope Ann and her many DEA members will agree with her, with us. Yeah. That is. Would you like okay. the agenda and motion? I'll make it. Uh, no, no, no. Now we have 7.0, uh, the consent agenda. Are you making the motion for that, Mardell? Yes, I, if you would okay. like. Okay, go ahead. Be it reserved that on the 25th day of January 2021, the Community Consolidated School District 59 Board of Education approved the consent agenda as presented and amended 7.04 Acceptance of Recommendations Human Resources Report A, B, and C. Do we have a second? Robert, Robert will second it. All right, roll call, please. Okay. Um, Mancia. Aye. Patrilli. Aye. Reed. Aye. Schumacher. Aye. Prinsky. Aye. Milovich. Aye. And Lang. Aye. And the motion passes. Okay. Now we need a motion to adjourn. And one second. Let me get my sheet. Oh God, okay, here it is. Uh, I'll do it. Um, can you hear me still? Yes. Okay. Be it resolved that on the 25th day of January, 2020, the Community Consolidated School District's uh, 59 Board of Education meeting is adjourned. Roll call, please. Um, Petrelli, aye. Reed? Aye. Schumacher? Aye. Um, Krinsky? Aye. 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 And Mencia. Aye. And the motion passes, and it is 938. All right.